Y'all set? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm good to go. I don't let's see, let me pull up my list here. Mute phone. Okay. All right, uh, so this will be pretty free form. This is, you know, not really anything formal. I have, you know, a, few, a few questions I, I want to ask, and you're welcome to go off on any kind of tangent you want, or bring up anything that's related or not related. It's pretty pretty casual. I don't I don't think people that's, are gonna see this coming. So that sounds perfect. I'm I'm pretty prone to tangents myself. So <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and hit the intro. That's uh, great. Hello, everyone. This is Under the Mayo, and I'm joined with a special guest today. This is Joseph O'Brien, co-writer of the RoboCop Prime Directive series that I recently just uh, covered on my channel. Joseph, uh, thank you for joining me. How are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, this was a big surprise. I mean, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> uh, and for you too, right? <laughs> yeah. So how, a very pleasant one, though. Yeah, how did, uh, like... Because you left a comment on my video, and before I get into yep. the videos themselves, like how were you made aware of, of what was going on? Uh, I was made aware over Twitter by another Robo fan, um, uh, a guy uh, named David Bassetta, who's an he's an artist in Spain, and he's a um, he's been a fan of Prime Directive since it was originally aired, and he's just one of those people that reached out, I think, many many years ago, and we've sort of followed each other on social media. Um, and he just reached out and said, Hey, Joe, you might want to see this video. It's, you know, it, somebody made a two hour video of Robocop studying Robocop prime directives and he liked it. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. well, I have to see that. First of all, the novelty of that alone. Uh, but honestly, um, uh, excellent work on those videos. I mean, uh, real seriously, good job. I've never seen anybody do that kind of a deep dive right. on, on those, those movies. Yeah, uh, it was it was very impressive. Yeah, it was it. it I started covering RoboCop stuff. Uh, I did a, a I reviewed a, I analyzed the first movie a couple of years ago because it's my favorite movie of all time. <clears throat> I did it as uh -huh. a as a hundred thousand sub special, and then this the this game was coming out, so I was like, hey, that's a good excuse to maybe revisit some stuff. Mm -hmm. I talked about RoboCop two and then three, and I was like, huh, Prime Directives, right? <laughs> And I, I just, I, I had these memories. I, I've so it's, it's been so weird. Um, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to take too much time away from you, and since this is an interview with you, but I, I have so much to, to, no, to no, say. No, 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 go, you go right ahead. Well. I'm, <laughs> I'm honestly, um, I'm honestly really curious about this whole journey for you because, um, I'm assuming you didn't see it when it first aired. I did. Oh, you did. Okay, I did. It, yeah, it came on sci-fi channel and i was so hyped yep. about it as a kid because i was mm -hmm. like what a four episode six hour mini series about robocop in the future i was so <laughs> excited and i and i watched it and i loved it and then i want to say maybe five or six years later i was talking with a bunch of friends about you know TV recommendations and stuff, and I I mentioned this right. show, and I was like, oh, you guys got to see Prime, RoboCop Prime Directives. That show was fucking awesome. And I'm thinking about like <laughs> like RoboCop is shooting Robo Cable in the mall, and yep. and the and the stuff is him as a cop before, and I'm thinking that's what I'm thinking about. And then so I'm like, okay, let's let's do it. And so we got it, I guess on DVD or something, and we watched it. Right. And we all hated it. It uh. it, it was like. Uh, like they hated it especially and i was just like right. this isn't this isn't what i remembered this isn't what and I remembered you were on the enjoying. hook for recommending it. oh god i was yeah i was in debt yeah for sure <laughs> i like well i, I apologize yeah. i'm so well, sorry for you well well that's it's this was part of the interesting stories because watching it later you know um i i feel like my love of robocop has really gone through different stages where uh when i'm younger What's what do I love about Robocop? Oh, his gun comes out of his leg. <laughs> right. He's fucking he's right. so cool, right? And and then like you get a little older and you start appreciating more like the satire stuff and the political commentary yep. and the jokes and you're like, oh wow, this is great. And then you start to really appreciate practical effects. But now as I'm older, 
uh, what I appreciate so much more than anything else is the humanity under it all is the, the story of Alex Murphy, which is just hold, yeah. what holds it all together. And so going back to prime directives, God, um, you know, almost 20 years later you know, or, or 15 yeah. years after the last time I saw it, it was mm-hmm. so interesting to rewatch it from that new perspective where I'm like, okay, yeah, right. well, budget effects, sure, fine, okay, you know, some of the acting's not great, and like all mm-hmm. the stuff that could be better, but I'm, but I'm, what I'm paying attention to is how focused it is on Alex Murphy, which is what frustrates me about other Robocop material, right. where it seems to not, where he doesn't, uh, I, where I wanted to see the character go in the sequels is not where it went, and and this show is the is the complete opposite, and. I, you know, for as much as I hate the biotech virus stuff or whatever, sure. which we'll get into. Uh, Absolutely. The, the journey of the person is fantastic. And so I kind of rediscovered this new appreciation and love for the series. And then you left this comment. And I was like, well, I didn't expect that. Uh, right. I, I didn't expect you to reach out. And I didn't know it would do as well as it did. I mean, it does have millions of views. Yeah. But it's hitting like 100,000 now in the first part. And I've introduced this series to a whole generation of young Robocop fans that didn't even know it existed. And uh, how do you feel about that? I think it's fantastic. Um, uh, it's it's it was. I had a moment where I debated whether I was going to reply or not because there's, there's this, you know, there's this possibility that it can appear self-serving or mm. or... Or, or you know, even a little sad, maybe. Um, but I was just so genuinely impressed with the videos uh, that I just wanted to reach out and just say, you know, thank you for doing this. And and to really just... It was just really nice to see someone that level of appreciation. Um, because we got absolutely uh, uh, crucified when it originally came out. The fans yeah. hated it. I got hate mail. Um, uh, there were now it's not a hundred percent hatred. We, we met a number of people who genuinely liked it. Like the people, this is the kind of what I've discovered with, with prime directives, the people who hate it, absolutely hate it. They despise it. Yeah. Um, the, but the people who love it really love it. Like they, they're not mediocre about it. They're, 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 they watch it a lot. They talk about it. It, it, it means something to them. And, that that's always very heartening when you when you you spend that amount of time working on something um it's that those little bits of appreciation make it really worthwhile um that somebody found something in it that mattered to them and it's it was just really nice to see that it that continues yeah i didn't remember the end of it uh, when I was rewatching, I didn't remember how it ends right. for his character. I mean, I remember how Cable sacrificing himself and everything, but I didn't remember right. what he said at the end, where that moment where he he states his prime directives, even though they've been deleted from his head. Yeah, that yeah, that was uh, that was really important. That was always wow. the ending. Like that was the ending we had in mind from the get go. We knew that we were always going to push towards that point where we were going to, uh, because as you say, like it. It was Alex Murphy's story that that resonated with us, and and I think we shared the frustration that you have with the sequels. And I don't want to badmouth the sequels because they're actually sure. There's a lot. There's a lot of great things about those things. I don't want to badmouth anybody else's work um, because I'm a fan of both of those sequels. Um, but yeah, it was some of that frustration that we had. That like, why aren't we going into the same kind of depth? that the first film went into. And it's because RoboCop went from being this, this almost an underground movie. I mean, nobody wanted to make that. It was kind of a miracle that it got made at all. Um, and then he very quickly, ironically became a product, right? He's a piece of IP. He's a yeah, brand. He's an action figure. And, and yeah. And so suddenly it was like, well, kids love RoboCop. So we have to start marketing, pushing it more in that direction and became, you know, into a PG 13 direction. And then in, into a PG direction with the TV show. And then there's, there's a Saturday morning cartoon. And that was where we, that's where RoboCop was when we got the job. Um, was like, wow, it's really devolved into this shadow of its former self. Like, what can we do to go back towards the first movie? And and we sat down, Brad Abraham, my writing partner and I sat down and said like, what do we love about RoboCop? And I was like, well, we love the story about this this man 
this guy in this horrible situation. Like, what I always said about RoboCop is it's a tragedy disguised as a comedy. Um, it's very funny, but the humor is very dark. And and it was that idea that we we wanted to really dig in on, and we were like, well, that's what we that's the story we wanted to tell more than anything else. Um, what does that guy look like ten years later, twenty years later? He looks miserable. He looks yeah. It's, well, because yeah. it's awful, right? Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> like, it's awful. The, the, the reality of RoboCop. A lot of people sort of they view, especially sort of the you know the action figure interpretation of RoboCop, and mm -hmm. a lot of people even they watch even the first movie that way. They sort of take take it in as a um, like a power fantasy. Yeah, right. He's a superhero. He's he's like Judge Dredd and Iron Man in one go. And and but the reality is is like he's a he's he's a guy who's had his life taken away from him. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we all, we have to still do this within the confines of, we're making a science fiction action satire, but it had to have that human core. Sure. Uh, that was always the, the place we, so we, yeah. So we started from that, that point was just, what is Alex Murphy doing 10 years later? You know, what happens when you're a machine that gets old is very different than a person who gets old, right? He's. He's obsolete in very specific ways, in a, in a way you can only do in RoboCop. You know, it's like this idea of him having, you know, he needs replacement parts that they don't make anymore. Mm -hmm. What do you That's do? That's so good. That's a right? great detail. And he's got to go on the like the black market to find to yeah. repair himself, and the company just yeah. keeps him down in a basement with like one doctor. Be because <laughs> he's a product. He's yeah. a piece of product, right? Like that's yeah. ultimately this this. Um, the the major theme of RoboCop, the first movie, and and to the same extent the prime directors that we tried to follow, was this idea of dehumanization, right? Like the degree to which not just Alex Murphy but people in general get sort of reduced to uh, product mm -hmm. or consumers, right? And and that's so we sort of sort of see it in different ways throughout the miniseries, but you know, it was always built around this one core idea of of, of Alex Murphy fighting for his humanity. Well, so how did you actually start working on the show? I mean, you're talking about this as writing it with with your friend or with your coworker. I mean, did it just happen yeah. out of nowhere and you pitched it, or did you get did you have connections to the production company and then they wanted you to do it? Like, how did this even start? So what happened was uh, Fireworks Entertainment, uh, which is a Canadian production company, they had the they were the company that produced the TV series. Yeah, uh, and they uh, the TV series had only done the one season, um, and they ha got to a point where they had to renew their rights op from uh, I think it was MGM at the time. And in order to keep the rights, they had to make something with RoboCop. So they had approached uh, Julian Grant. Uh, Julian was a uh, producer and director of uh, a lot of Julian worked in the low budget action sphere. Um, and I had known him uh, because we had briefly worked at the same company. Uh, sort of working on these kind of blockbuster back rack action movies with actors like Michael Dudikoff and Don the Dragon Will and things like that. And uh, he had been approached by Fireworks. So that, Would you make this? We want to make a Robocop miniseries. And Julian came to me and said, would you like to write this RoboCop miniseries? And I was like, uh, obviously, yes. <laughs> it was an immediate yes. Um, and it was, but it was like, it was like, okay, well, we have to start now. And I, and I need the scripts in about six months. And I'm like, okay, that's a huge job. Yeah. Um, that's four feature films. Why, why was, and, why did they want, why did they want it to be so long? Because I, I think that's I'm, part I'm of, not, part of Prime Directive's negative side is that it does go on sure. too long like if it had been two hours shorter like that could have mm -hmm. been a really really focused tight story why did they need so yeah, much I, i'm not certain i don't know that but it, it was always like, the directive came down like it was going to be four parts um and it was just it was i guess it was a mini series format that they they could sell um but this is you know this is people well above my pay grade yeah, making that choice, but it was like so. That was the assignment, right? It was like four movies. Um, they sort of wanted them to be uh, independent of each other, story wise. Uh, and I was kind of like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Um, oh, no. If if we're gonna tell, if you've got 
if you if somebody hands you six hours, you want to be able to do as much as possible with those six hours. I didn't just want to make the same movie four times. The first so two I reached the, out. The first two and the second two kind of feel like different stories in a way. Oh, there's a, and there's a reason for that, which we can get into. Okay. Um, so I reached out to um, uh, my writing partner at the time, Brad. Uh, we had written a couple of scripts together, and I was like, "Do you?" Uh, and he had not had anything produced at that point. Uh, but I reached out and said, do you want to, do you want to co-write Robocop with me? And he was also an immediate, yes. I mean, he's, nobody's saying no to this. Yeah. Um, so I, so I pitched Brad to Julian. Julian knew me and trusted me because he knew I could get the job done. Um, so I brought Brad on, um, and we sat down and kind of concocted four movies. Um, the, uh, the original titles were, uh, Dark Justice, uh, Meltdown, uh, the Human Equation and Wet Wired, and those were very the, the second two were very different originally. Um, but we sat down and wrote uh, treatments for what we wanted to do, and and a lot of the elements. I just I actually just dug these up yesterday. I was looking around in my head. I was like, I still had the the original treatment that we used to pitch to Fireworks, um, and a lot a lot of the elements are are we established really early. Cable was already a big part of it. James Murphy was a big part of it. Uh, Damien and Ed and Saint were a big part of it, um, and Kadic was a big part of it. And he was a he is, that character changed massively over the course of development. But um, it was always going to be this story about Alex Murphy, his old partner Cable, that he'd had a falling out with, uh, who had through various turns of the plot, you know, become his counterpart as a second cyborg. They would begin as enemies. They would eventually collide become sort of begrudging partners and then cable would sacrifice himself and murphy would emerge as a fully realized alex murphy 2.0 uh free of all of his his uh, programming so you had that whole foundation. and able to make his own decisions you know the whole fan foundation that was planned out from that was like where you started yeah that was that was the story we wanted to tell okay like that was the fundamentally the story we wanted to tell and in cable was like I feel like I've seen things online that talk about like a, a dark Robocop. Um, was, was there any? I haven't actually looked into it myself. Was there anything that came before in Robocop lore that cable was based on? No, cable was just we had this idea of just one of the very first things I did when I when I got the gig. This was in 1998. This is like late 1998. Um, was and I do this sometimes when I'm working on a project just to kind of get a sense of you know what it could be. And I took a uh, I opened Photoshop and I got an old picture of Peter Weller uh, from I think Robocop 2. And I, I in Photoshop, I made the armor black and I gave him a second gun and I just put him next to the picture of Peter Weller and I sent that to Julian and I was like, Can't what do you what do you think? Right? It was just it was a very striking idea that was like we could have two, yeah, and and we hadn't really seen that before i mean robocop 2 had had explored the idea of a second robocop but it didn't look like robocop yeah he wasn't a he wasn't he wasn't a mirror image and we wanted a a, a very deliberately a mirror image i like uh, robo so cable. that was with that I, I, it, a lot of people like robo cable yeah. um i'm a big fan of robo cable i have uh i have a custom action figure of robo cable that oh, somebody cool. made for me. it was pretty cool <laughs> um uh, Morris Dean Wint, who plays him, is uh, is a really good friend of mine to this day. Oh, did, did you send him the the videos? Please do if you still talk to him. I did. I oh, I no, no, I did. I did. I talked to him all the time. <laughs> oh, great, great. That is uh, he and Maria? Sorry, go ahead. Now I was gonna I was gonna say and um, Paige Fletcher. Is there any like, like this is the biggest like like a huge role for him that I, mm -hmm. I maybe he's never even heard real appreciation for like is is there any way to get this I, to him too I, page page i lost touch with shortly after we wrapped production mm. and he is kind of a ghost like he i, I can't find him to this if i'm not mistaken yeah i think i think prime directors was the last thing he did professionally as an actor wow um uh and yeah he just kind of ghosted like no i'm i'm friends with loads of the other a lot of the other actors actors uh maria del mar who plays sarah is a really good friend of mine and and just so the fans know maria and morris are are best friends in real life morris so all that oh, animosity morris. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, okay they are best friends in more they are best friends in real life um <laughs> uh really really lovely people they play a great like like uh 
bickering divorced couple. Oh yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they're, so they they <laughs> they had a really good time doing that. They really enjoyed that. <laughs> nice office. It could use a woman's touch. It's like what a good Oh yeah, yeah. We had, we had a lot of fun just writing those scenes. Um it's the thing is that when you when you have this many characters over that much time, you you have a lot of opportunities to write Mm -hmm. to just write like two handers for different groups of people. So like, we really enjoyed writing Sarah, Sarah and John. Uh, we really enjoyed writing Damien and Ed Hobley because they had all of this weird history that we'd invented for them. Um, and it was just this idea of this, this, this sort of know nothing idiot boss and the guy who did all the actual work, but he was stuck down in the basement. Damien's well, casting he, was, I just, I've really come to uh, appreciate him. He is hilarious sometimes. Kevin Kevin is one of those guys who I remember talking to him about this. Kevin Jubinville, the actor who played Damien. Um uh we we wrote him in a really specific way. And sometimes when you write a character who is not particularly bright, um, an actor can get a little uh bristly about that. And and not want to necessarily because they don't want to they just don't want to seem stupid, right? Okay. And I talked to him about that. I said, you know, I, th I really appreciate that, you know, that you really, you, you, you really dug down on, on how kind of dumb Damien is. And he's like, he's an imbecile. I love it. It's great. <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, we also wanted to talk about, you know, it's like, even though he's kind of, he's funny because he's dumb, he's also incredibly dangerous for the exact same reason. Yes. Yeah, because he'll, I mean, like, him and Sarah are perfect for each other because they, they will Absolutely. just do whatever they want. To, to to get to the top yeah, yeah and that was another thing we we enjoyed writing those sort of you know the you, you write the corporate machinations in ocp those are fun scenes and and then there's you know the, the stuff between uh murphy and james towards the towards the end in part four um that was always a scene that got a lot of people even even back when we shot it and when we when we first showed it to people that was a scene a lot of people talked about i was really happy with how that turned out yeah that's the that was a really really standout scene, and Paige Fletcher just like kicked it, just like wow he just hit Paige was great yeah. and he he took it so seriously you, yeah that's what you um, can really see, and he really um, and he like he had the hardest job he even even he had even his armor was like so his armor, uh is Peter Weller's armor it's it's the same molds um oh, they were right. built for peter weller so they so so if it, the suit occasionally looks clunky it's because it's not actually built for him yeah um but the cable suit was built for morris by rob Botine at rob Botine studio wow um okay. and that was so, so that was so that was a brand new suit um uh, and that cost it that that cost a ton of money um but but it was a brand new it was made from carbon fiber there were new materials so it was much lighter yeah. Um, and it had a lot more flexibility to it. Um, but Paige was the the original film suits were really heavy, uh, so he was he was carrying a ton of weight around while trying to act, while trying to do these action scenes, um, and never complained about it. But you could just tell he was always very like determined, um, and he was taking them, and he you know, and he was just taking the material so seriously, um, and it never phased him. God, I would love to talk to him. <laughs> I would too. I'd just love to know what happened to the guy. He he he's just you know he's like he fell off the face of the earth. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Damien and and Edwin, right? And uh, yep. there's there's a part in there near the end where it is suggested that the Saint AI is built on a child, but there's yeah, nothing that else was, in the that show. Was... Well, was something cut? I don't know if it was cut. I'm trying to remember now There's how nothing. much of that made it into the final product. Our our concept for the character was that Ed had lost his family uh, in a car accident. That's why he has the cane. He's he's uh, 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 he's been he's been wounded, um, and that but that he had managed to preserve his daughter's uh, uh, engrams as a as an algorithm basically and that algorithm became the core of the ai yeah. that he built that damien then sold to ocp and became an executive and that's how saint that was basically the birthplace of saint 
Um, but that's a lot of backstory that we had. We wrote tons of things like that for the characters. Yeah. So that we wrote a whole backstory for uh, Sarah and John Cable, where they came from, um, where they had ended up. We this is the same thing. There's a, a lot of characters in this film have history that we didn't see. You know, there's like James has a whole his whole childhood. We sure. sort of have to sketch in um, because it's not germane to the to the plot. Yeah. But you still want to give it a sense that like there's a life outside of the movie. So yeah, the the premise was always that uh Ed had tried to preserve his daughter in the only way he knew how. And then Damien, in much as I said, the this idea of dehumanizing and commodifying people, uh Damien had turned it into a piece of product. Um, because Damien was the money guy and he was a guy who could like get lots of money. Mm -hmm. And he founded it. He has a statement where he says he, his name is Damien Lowe and he founded a company called Lowe Technologies, which I thought was funny. <laughs> um, it was one of those jokes that was like, it was after the factory realized he, oh God, his company is called Lowe Technologies. That's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so he kept the joke. Um, and the Damien was, you know, Ed's trying to create, just, Ed's whole mission is just to preserve his daughter. And, Damien, but he needs funding to do that, and Damien became his partner, and so that's essentially what their whole wow. dynamic was. And that Damien then sold his company to OCP uh, in exchange for an executive position. And then, of course, he gets stuck at the kids' table. And uh, uh, and that Ed got relegated to the basement, still doing the same job he was always doing with no appreciation, but because he was so driven by the, by the, uh, the emotion... Um, Damien was just taking advantage of him to this day. And so, yeah, poor Ed gets really, uh, he gets really abused in the course of the movie. And again, David Fraser, the actor who plays Ed, is a really great actor, really, really great guy. Uh, he he was always looking for new ways for to kind of humanize Ed and, and also sort of show his vulnerability. That's, man, hearing all that, that's that's upsetting because, what, like, just I just recently rewatched this show and there's no hint of the family thing with Edwin until mm -hmm. like the last ten minutes of the show when he's like, "Remember that time yeah. when you were five? And you, and I'm it, like, "What? What? It, what are you talking it got about?" Kind of, yeah, yeah, it got kind of buried. Um, there's little things like you see. There's I think there's a photograph of his family. Yeah, he like looked desk when he's there's, there's little touches in the background, but I don't know that they read necessarily to to a viewer. Yeah, it doesn't. Because but they are he, there. They are there. When he picks up the photo and looks at it, it's when he's packing up his stuff because he's been fired. So I mean, like, yeah, like how there's no way to know that he's like missing his family. It's like he's just packing up his stuff, and and so I like that was that was like I, I would have loved to see some more development towards that side. Well, yeah, I would have too. It's 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 ironic because you know even though we had six hours, it wasn't enough time to sort of get everything. And it's it's one of those things where it's like it's too sh it's too it's too long and too short at the same time. Um, if we'd had twelve episodes of a series like yeah. a streaming series like Netflix, we could have spent an entire episode just on Ed. Yeah. Here's where Ed came from. Here's the whole you know, yeah. and just made that and made that part of the story, right? But ultimately. Um, our mandate was always, you know, keep it focused on Robo, keep it focused on that primary story. Sure. Well, you're so unfortunately, secondary characters sometimes don't get the the attention that they deserve. But the but there was always that thought was always there. You're you're talking a lot about um, the actors and and you know in a lot of productions the writer isn't necessarily that involved with you know the actual production of the show because you have directors sure. and everything like that but you're you're talking very hands on so i mean like well, how involved were you in the actual production of the show oh very involved so i i got really spoiled on uh, on that production so there was there was like this so Julian and Brad and myself were like this secret little club of Robo fans who were, it was kind of like the lunatics were running the asylum. We were really, Julian was our, our interface with, uh, with fireworks and he was very good at dealing with the executives, but you know, then he would come to me and go, okay, we're going to just, we're going to do this crazy thing. Um, and he was very receptive to a lot of the ideas. Um, he was the same way. He wanted to make something that was, you know, as close to R rated as we could get um fireworks was very thought they were going to get a kid show and mm. we were like no 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 we're not we're not making that we'll we'll kind of tell them you know we're not gonna we're not gonna tell them exactly what we're doing we're not lying to them or anything but at the same time we're like this is in the script it's all going in um 
and ultimately like they had final say and as it turned out this is you know they they shot down two of our scripts late in the game but um we were like the secret little club of just kind of like running around doing whatever we could and so because of that and because we we had an established a level of trust um brad and i were basically given the run of the place like i was on set most of the time i spent a lot of time i worked on i developed key art that i like for, I didn't get paid for any of this. I developed key art that ended up getting... I keep seeing it. It shows up on the internet every once in a while. Um, just in Photoshop. It's not like the greatest key art in the world, but it was it was something because we didn't have, have money to do that kind of thing. And we were just trying to find ways to add value wherever we could because we really believed in it and we really wanted it to be the best we could we could make it. Um, so it's 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 disappointing, obviously, when it falls short, you know, when the rubber meets the road... Eventually, you, you you sort of go. We were very ambitious, but we didn't quite have the money to pull off some of the things we wanted to. Yeah. Um. Uh. But in some cases, that was time. In some cases, that was money. Um. In some cases, it was the weather. Uh. The the end fight with Robo and and Cable, um, was originally supposed to take place on a skyscraper rooftop. It was supposed to take place on the roof of OCP. Um, and the night that it was scheduled to be shot, we had, there was a helicopter was going to be searching. There was this huge, it was going to be a big blowout ending. Um, and El Nino hit and we was just brutal, brutal rainstorm, uh, thunderstorm. I remember I was up there the night that it came out. Um, you know, one of the effects guys pointed out to, to Morris is like, because he was wearing a carbon fiber suit, he was actually the most electrically conductive thing up there. He refused to, <laughs> you know, go anywhere near the rooftop. Uh, and so we had to, you know, and there was just massive safety concerns. There was just no way to shoot. Uh, so they ended up having to shoot the scene in the same building, but like inside. So there's that little super crowded kind of nondescript area where they have their final fight. That was supposed to be a whole fight on a rooftop. Hmm. And there just wasn't, we weren't able to do it. It just, it, it, there was a, there was a, there was a point on the schedule where it could be shot. Getting permission to shoot up there was a huge thing. And then the night it was ready, to, they were supposed to shoot it. It just went to hell. Well, shit. And they had to scramble. So that's, that's you know, one of those... That's just one of the things that happens. You go, okay. So suddenly our big, giant ending got turned into, like, you know, two guys fighting inside a box. Huh. Uh, and, and I don't want to make excuses for anything, but that was just that was just the reality, yeah, right? Yeah, just what happened. And, you know, we, we wrote... We, we wrote very ambitious scripts, and in some cases we had money to do that, and in some cases we didn't. It was just the the money was not distributed in a in a symmetrical way. Could you, so it would it would get. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say. Could you tell me some other uh, ideas or script points that had to be sacrificed or or were shot down? Um, let me think. Well, I will say one thing that that one of the interesting fallouts, like it is. Some of the criticism that have come up both in your video and 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 other places in the past, uh, weird weird artifacts of scheduling and budgeting. Okay, so the scene where Murphy is in the um, in the tech market in Old Detroit when he has the big cloak on. Yeah, there was actually a comment uh, from one, of the, one of the actors in that scene in the video talking about that. Yeah, T tell me about so, it. So, so you quite rightly point out. He looks ridiculous because he's got this hood over his face, and, yeah. And he's but he's got the he's got the helmet on. So as scripted, he's supposed to have the helmet off. Oh. So he's supposed to be in the helmet out makeup, and he's got th this hood over his face, and he's sort of kind of passing for human because that whole, whole episode is about Murphy's journey because he's killed Cable, and he sort of self destructs. He says he doesn't have a name anymore. He destroys his. Uh, his gravestone he's sort of trying to obliterate himself because he can't he can't see the alex murphy anymore right he doesn't know who he is because he's he's killed his only friend yeah and this is so he's kind of on this very self-destructive tip and then when he ends up in old detroit he kind of goes the other way he starts this journey back this is the beginning of his journey back towards humanity and ultimately back to the you know in the final in the final moments of the final episode this is the beginning of that part of the journey um the idea was that he, if you took the helmet off and threw a cloak, or, he could pass for as a person. If you, yeah, if you if you covered his chest plate, you know, and yeah, he could make it work. Yeah. So the problem is, um, the 
that makeup takes time away from the, the shooting schedule. So every time Paige was going to be out of the helmet, it was going to be like an extra three hours before we would have the lead actor on set. And ultimately, a decision was made, not by me, um, that it would just be easier and faster because of the and because of the size and scope of that particular scene, because that was a big day, lots of extras. Uh, it was a big location. Those are that that's an expensive day, and not having your lead actor available for that day is you're not getting your money's worth out of the day, basically. Um, so a decision was made that it would be more economical just throw the helmet on him and he'll be and that'll be that and so and unfortunately the result is the result but it was literally scripted that he didn't have the helmet on interesting and so that's that's my that's my in my defense that's uh, that's what it was supposed they could to look have just like just pulled it down more you know like to where you could only see his mouth they could have just done that yep. and they didn't there were there were there were there were discussions but ultimately it was like this is what's happening Wow. And that was one of the days I wasn't on set because I was sick that day. I remember it distinctly. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I miss that one. Um, so it, it's just it just becomes like weird, mm-hmm. weird bits of practicality that intrude on the ideal version of a scene or something that you want. Is every you know there's little compromises that happen along the way, and that unfortunately was one of them. And unfortunately, you're not wrong when you say he, it looks ridiculous. It, well, um, I, I, don't, I try not. This this is about my changing perspective with this show as I'm getting. Or older, sure, is, is that I, yeah, I, it it doesn't look good. But the thing is, I'm trying to look past that stuff and being like, I love this idea. I like this concept. Mm-hmm. I, like, I like this story yeah. point. And like, okay, it doesn't look like how it should look, right? But I I get over that in about twenty seconds, and yeah. then I I take in like, wow. So he's looking for parts in a black black market, and he's trying to hide among the people. Like that's cool. Like. I'm, I'm, and I appreciate I'm a lot that. more forgiving of, of, of that stuff. The, 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 as I say, the people who really respond to prime directives, um, those are the things they respond to. It's, it's, it tends to be more conceptual because mm-hmm. we were not able to, in a number of cases, we were not able to really realize it the way we wanted to realize it. Um, and that's not any one person's fault. That's sure. just, you know, and and it, it, the the blame is as much on me and anybody because we wrote a very ambitious script, and with you know nobody ever told us not to do things, so we just did it, uh, and then it became someone else's job to realize that, and sometimes the resources were there, and sometimes the resources were not there. Um, uh, that big, but that's a you know that's a big expensive looking shot. There's a it's a crane shot. Yeah. There's loads of extras. It's a there's a ton of production design going on there, and that's probably one of the. One of the things I wanted to do, um, and I, I think it comes across in fits and starts, and again, this is probably me being overly ambitious, um, because we were doing RoboCop and projecting it into its own future, as it were. It was essentially, you know, the first RoboCop was was science fiction, but, you know, like 15 minutes into the future. This was, we wanted to just go, okay, what is this? What does the future of RoboCop look like? That's why we wanted, like, let's just have Delta City be a thing. Because there was this constant running joke that they've never built Delta City. I'm like, well, let's make it Delta City. Let's make it this modern, futuristic environment. But then also let's have the ruins of old Detroit underneath it as a as a contrast. And it would become almost post-apocalyptic. It's like a wasteland. Yeah. And so what's going on out there? This is, you know, so that you have disenfranchised people. But it's a technological society still. So it's all about black market technology. and And it was really... I was really into um, I was really into cyberpunk at the time. I mean, I still am, but um, I really wanted to inject that idea, that kind of William Gibson neuromancer idea of of high tech and low tech colliding, mm-hmm. and and that's where um, uh, Anne and Kadic and all of that stuff in Old Detroit came from. That's where that big market. The idea that he goes to this like very sketchy underground market to buy high technology was something that I found interesting. And there's this idea that, you know, there would be people who were like living out on the fringes, but they would have cybernetic implants and they would have access to like weird technology. You know, it's kind and of, I like, wanted to kind of bring that into RoboCop. It's kind of like that scene in minority report where he, yeah. he goes and gets his eyes switched out in this like place. Completely. That looks like completely. Yeah. And it's this, and it's this idea, right? Like if you've read any like, like serious cyberpunk novels or even played, you know, Cyberpunk 2077, the, um, 
there is this just this this idea of an aesthetic of a world that li- that is like this. It's run down, but also extremely technological, and that's what RoboCop is. So I thought that that would be a a good fit. Um, uh, whether it was or not, you know, it, I think sometimes it works. I think sometimes it's ridiculous, as you pointed out with the uh, um, the techno organic virus that I sort of had to cook up in about five minutes. Okay, before we get to that, but that one's that, that one that one's all on me. Um, so, and that's all. Your criticisms are well taken. Believe me, I don't have any. Uh, uh, I take none of this personal. Well, I'm glad you're a good sport um, about it because you know, like, oh look look. Yeah. It, it it's a it's a goofy idea. Um, I knew it was a goofy idea, but we needed something because. Um, uh, let me just uh, yeah, I'm just maybe gonna address this now. Um, the original plan. Uh, we had so we wrote we we had our scripts approved. We had this treatment for what we wanted to do. Um, the treatment was approved. We wrote the first two scripts. Um, and then we wrote the second two scripts and the second two were definitely, we we're going to push more into this, this science fiction, cyberpunk kind of place. Like the first one is very much in the same world as the first RoboCop, right? It's OCP, it's Delta city, it's cops. Um, and then the second one, we start to move out of that a little bit. We introduce Robo cable and that conflict. And then, and then we knock both at the end of, of the second movie, of course, they're stuck in old Detroit. And the idea we were going to spend some time in old Detroit and, and it was going to get really weird. And uh, uh, Murphy and Cable basically end up captured by uh, Kadic. And Kadic in this version originally isn't this kind of Republic serial mad scientist. He's a, um, he's a religious leader of this cult of people who worship technology. And they sort of live in the sewers under old Detroit and they have a, a sort of pseudo cathedral and they're all, they all have these bioorganic implants and they're creating, they're all writing code. They're all basically code monkeys. Um, and, but, but it was, it was given this kind of religious overlay and, and the reason they were doing it is because Kadic was being manipulated by uh, an artificial intelligence called Legion. What we will eventually, okay. what we eventually find out is that Legion is Saint, but no one knows this. So, so Ed's built Saint out in the out at OCP, and Saint has sort of snuck out and manipulated this guy into helping it write new code for itself that will essentially unshackle it. Okay, that's um, a better idea. Yeah, well, I thought so, <laughs> um, and so and so that became so when robo uh when the robos when robocop and robocable get involved with these guys they're damaged obviously at the end of the fight uh at the end of episode two um murphy has taken the brunt of it he's really fucked up and they plug murphy into legion and so a big chunk of that episode that i really really wish we gotten to do it's basically they plug him in and Alex Murphy wakes up in as Alex Murphy in a bedroom with his and his wife is there and his kid is there and he's living his contemporary life as though he'd never become RoboCop and Cable is there and everything's fine. And we spend a bunch of time with him in this environment where he starts he's go, starts to suspect like what is going on? What is going on in my life? And we realize he's been plugged into a, a construct that uh that legion that saint is using to study him because it wants to understand uh well the title of the episode which was the human equation it wants to understand what people are like and he's the perfect interface for that because he's part man part machine and so it's essentially using him as a guinea pig to to help it build its own code and free itself and it ended with murphy as a human confronting RoboCop, like he was going to stand in front of him and actually like have a whole back and forth and then ultimately escape by killing himself. Um, and then, but by the same token, the Legion will have, would have escaped and reactivated and Saint would have gone online. And then all of Delta city was going to be in chaos. And that was going to be the fourth question. Movie. What, what was Saint's yeah. interest in RoboCop? 
it was trying to understand it was just trying to understand like we we only got one draft in so it it's still it's a little soft we never okay. really got a chance to further develop it but the the essential idea was that it was it was trying to understand people so it could be it could kill them better i think ultimately it was it was there it had sinister intentions all right um but it but it was using this man machine interface because it was unique um as a way to build its own programming i can't i honestly can't remember exactly how we did it but that was the idea of the the important thing was to get to this place where we got to spend time with alex murphy as if he had never been robocop okay I, and then I, it would end that. and then it, yeah and i just love this image of like alex face to face with robocop and just you know be just just talking about his 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 life that could have been and how how angry he is at robocop and sort of taking all of his emotion out on that um and then we it and then we sent those in and there was like silence and then it came back that it was like too much sci-fi we don't we don't want this um we want action we want the robocop action that you guys were giving us in the first two we want that sort of thing um but we were you know we had spent all of our time on those scripts we had, so we were heading towards production sets were being built actors were being cast and we we're like okay so we had very little time to go back but we you know turned them around in pretty much record time i think they gave us an extra 3 or 4 weeks to sort of turn those scripts around but we had to very quickly focus on action scenes um uh, and just kind of keeping a a, a more a more mainstream approach right that was going to be a little less, I guess, less challenging to the to the average viewer. Mm -hmm. Mad, um, Mad Man know, fire, wants well, revenge. Virus. Yeah, and it just and so it became very. It's it's very cliched. Um, it's not as it's not as thought through. But we sort of we kept some of the, we tried to keep some of the elements. So so we just sort of moved it into like, okay, Kadic used to have a cult and that broke up and that's where where the uh, our heroic trio came from. Mm -hmm. um, but they all have these control implants that they burned out of their heads and that's why he's sort of on his own now. So there again, there's this, all this backstory that gets alluded to, but we never go into any real detail about. Except for you see these star these star shaped scars on their heads. Yeah. Yeah, and we make sort of an oblique there's an oblique reference to it but but again it's a lot of backstory that is just backstory and sometimes people are still confused by it or 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 they just don't like it which is all fine and that's fine um like i said it's it was um it was just really all of it born out of my desire to kind of like cyberpunk ro robocop up a bit yeah and that's unfortunate that they that they made you change directions on that because like it, that's that's probably my least favorite thing in the series is the biotech mm -hmm. virus and, and what happened oh yeah you're yours in a lot of people yeah goes. and um like I, like i was saying it's, in my, it's my video, definitely the goofiest stuff yeah yeah and it's it, uh i don't know it hit it just hit wrong when i watched it later a few years later because we had already gone sure, sure. so past that idea it was it's like it's very lawnmower man you know, well, it's very, it's very. Uh, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. It was, it was very much a product of its moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have to sort of flash back to look. So, like, we started this in 1998. Yeah. Um, and then the Matrix comes we were out. Writing an early, the Matrix comes out, and that really is like such a zeitgeist moment for not just movies, but like we were doing. That's where we were going. Like we were influenced by a lot of the same things, um, but you know, with you know a tenth of the budget. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we were, you know, we, we were looking at things like ghost in the shell and we were looking at things, uh, like John Woo movies. That's one of the reasons cable has two guns and, and a lot of that, it was just all in the air at that time. Right. Um, the matrix just did it perfectly. Yeah. Um, well, it's and hard, we were it's hard to compare yourself to the matrix. <laughs> oh no. I mean, it's, it's a, that's a losing proposition, yeah. right? Oh, I but ultimately, to... I just just as a just as a just as a as a an indicator of the time period and the sort of things that were on everybody's mind, that was very much what was on our mind at the same time. So right. you will see these ideas, you know, in lots of movies in that time. Lawnmower Man, for example, Ghost in the people were sort of tr trying. Yeah, yes, trying to 
just trying to deal with technology in a creative way and trying to sort of understand the world we were living in, the world we were heading towards. And, and that was also on our minds. And we, unfortunately, <laughs> it came out as this goofy idea of a, of a computer virus that could jump to people. Yeah. Um, that was, it was definitely this idea that needed, it needed more time to be, to just think about it and execute on it. And, and, but we needed something that would, would be an existential threat that wasn't just this a abstract, a computer is going to come online and it's going to, you know, take over your house. It's going to house. turn like, on it, everyone's, it wasn't really, it's going to turn on everyone's it, heat. It had, <laughs> there had to be, there had to be a bomb, right? Yeah. And so that was the bomb. Right. Yeah. You had to have some kind out. of crisis to, to get everyone to work together. Yeah, and so and it had to endanger everybody. It had to endanger old Detroit. It had to endanger Delta City. It had to endanger Murphy. It had to endanger James. It was all of these. Everyone had to have the same stakes oh, and be you, fighting for the same thing. You know what it could have been? It could have been mm. a virus that messes people up, messes everyone up to the point to where they have to depend on technology so that they would all basically be part of the cult. Right. Something Where like were that. you? Oh, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> like that, boom. That's what stands out to me. Guy, cult leader, worships yeah. technology. Make everyone like this. Hmm. Yeah. So there's, you know, and again, this is one of these things where if we'd had more time, more money, yeah. um, uh, you know, we would have it would have been a world building thing, right? Where we could have been like, oh, okay, we're in a future where. Uh, everybody just has some kind of implant as a matter of course so we're all connected somehow physically connected to our computers which is not that far from where we are right now if you look yeah at a stuff. lot of the stuff in the show is very now uh, things that like in the show uh, they're like it's scary and now it's just like oh that's just what we have now Oh look, Saint is <laughs> yeah. Saint Saint is Facebook, right? Saint yeah. is social media. Saint is, you know, and we and and Damien is like, you know, we were like warning people, this is what happens when you let an idiot be in charge. Mm -hmm. It's very dangerous. Yeah, this it's I think the satire like uh I think I would put the satire under the first movie but over the sequels. In, well, I That's, I do that for a lot was, of things. It was it was hard to get, but it was again the the that whole aspect of it was so so that was an important discussion we had immediately as well, and that's in a lot of our early documents. Is is like what is the specific language of RoboCop that makes it identifiable? Like that you know you're watching a RoboCop movie as opposed to anything else, and the satire is a huge part of that. And the the thing is, the first movie makes it look easy, mm -hmm. but it invent it invented this whole idea, like this <laughs> this this notion of like cutting to media breaks in the middle of like cutting to commercial in the middle of a film that you're sitting in a theater watching and it just did such a great job of establishing a tone and it's not an easy tone i can tell you from experience it's not an easy tone to nail um yeah. it has to be funny but it also has to be very darkly funny and if it's too dark it, it you lose the satire um it just becomes upsetting uh but if you don't drill down on something it's just goofy and i think you know some of the some of the later stuff like robocop 2 and 3 the where it really falls down for me is some of the ads don't make they don't really quite land the same way as yeah. the first one the first one is so on point and they're more grounded and i think we did oh yeah but you know it's, and it's if you're not careful you end up doing something ridiculous and i think we definitely went to the ridiculous place a few times but more or less, we were trying to do in 1999 what RoboCop had done in 1987. So we weren't going to do parodies of commercials from the 80s. We were going to do what was happening now and what was. So there's a up here in in Canada. Um, there's a an all news channel called CP24, which was very cutting edge at the time, um, and it was inset windows and lots of different banners with different pieces of news coming at you and this was just a 24-hour news channel so we based medianet on that and just would let you know it's not just going to be two anchors on tv it's going to be an inset window with anchors talking but above and below them will be different bits of of, of information some of it will be ads because everything is commodifiable right everything is you know this is why we had this constant running thing like every time you see a news story 
within two seconds of the news story breaking, there'd be an ad for the video or action figures or, you know, yeah. the darkest one was, you know, John Cable memorabilia right after he's been killed. Yeah, it, it's, it, it was, the the satire was, I don't know, I, I don't, ahead of his time isn't the word I'm looking for. It was like, it, it, was, it seems so far-fetched at the time. Yeah, and less I, so now. Which is, yeah, which is maybe why it didn't land. But now mm-hmm. I watch it and they're like selling what, – what's his name? Bone bone Crusher? Bone, bone, well, bone Machine. Yeah, Bone Machine. They're selling <laughs> yes, bone, bone Machine, machine. Action, action figures on the news. Yeah. And I, I'm like, yeah. okay. I like, it doesn't but, seem but as think crazy. About, <laughs> well, if you, listen, you click on any web page, right? What are mm-hmm. you going to get? You're going to get the information that you're looking for and then ad, you're going to be ad. bombarded with ads that have – you know, that are based on your last five Google searches. Yeah. It's yeah. Right. I, I really came to appreciate the 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 media break uh, points of satire in, in Prime Directives on upon reading. Those were those were a lot of fun. Those were a lot of fun to write. Um, yeah, this, I can the, tell. the one thing you the one thing you you didn't touch on um, uh, was the uh, the Archie Nemesis breaks. Yeah, um, I couldn't fit it in. I just Mark didn't. Breslin. I didn't find a way to fit it into the script. Uh, <laughs> and then I was I ha- I was going to mention him. The where he, where uh, Damien tells him what to say, I had that in my script. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, but I haven't really established this guy. And I was like, ah, I just yeah. I just oh yeah, no, it's it. it's okay. You well, this is the thing, right? You 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 always you always make more than you have. Like we as we discussed, I had you know we had so much material that we wanted to put in that was just no space for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but Archie was like, you know, what if we just had this like, you know, ranting lunatic? But ultimately, <laughs> it's like even the counterculture ranting lunatic is part of the program. Yeah. He's designed to make he's designed to look crazy so it makes all the stuff OCP does seem rational by comparison. That's great. That's great. You know, I, I don't know if I mentioned it in my first Robocop video. It's too it's been too long, but there was a moment it was in two like late two thousand one so we're like mm-hmm. a, few, a few months after the World Trade Center attack where like, you know, that yep. was what the, it didn't matter if it was national or local news. That's what they were always talking about. They were always talking about. Yes. That. But then after mm-hmm. after a few months, I, I, I was too I'm too young to really remember it. But I, I do remember the news. Local news was on and they were they were talking about their programming coming up after the next commercial break. And they show like three different segments that were coming up on the news program. And yeah. segment two was like, it was like the hunt for Bin Laden, and then the weekend weather forecast. <laughs> was, mm-hmm. And I was like, it's, "You just said that so casually." <laughs> it's interesting how everything gets normalized, right? Yeah, it's like now and, we're in Robocop. And, this is Robocop. <laughs> well, I mean, when you think about even in, uh, I remember this when nine eleven happened. It was, it was. Within a few days, you know, CNN had like the 9/11 music and a branded logo, mm. and and it's like, you know, that didn't just happen. There were committee meetings and discussions, and artists were hired, and you know, there's a lot of money got sure. spent, and so it's like everything gets turned into product, and it gets yeah. normalized, and it gets branded, and that is as true now more than ever. But it was certainly. If anything, it's 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 indicative of just how prescient the original RoboCop was, right? Yes. And we were just following that through line. The Family Heart Center selling you the Yamaha series right. heart. That's the first ad in Remember, the Remember, we the, care. Yeah, that's the first ad in the movie. And I think that I think that it's, ad is so understated, it goes over a lot of people's heads over how it, like crazy and it, it is. And it's it's interesting too because it's um, it does a really smart screenwriting thing too, because it's establishing a bunch of thematic ideas right away. This idea of uh, prosthet- body prosthetics and replaceable mm-hmm. parts, and also, but also, corporate commodification of human beings. And your remember, we care. Oh, that completely yeah. disingenuous. Like the fact that he walks off camera. That's probably as goofy as I guess. Like that's the big giveaway, right? Because he walks off camera and then leans back in and delivers that line. Oh. <laughs> um, which which is just just it's just a little. It's that little two percent over the top that really makes RoboCop, right? Yeah. It's 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 it just rides the line to where like it feels yeah, like it, a, it actually feels like a real commercial. And that's and that's all Paul Verhoeven, right? Like that mm-hmm. is such a uh, because he was an outsider looking in on America. Yeah. Um, 
uh, you know, the original. He did, all the stuff he did. Um, to ma the changes that he made were things like, we're not going to show. I think the original script, the idea for the original media breaks were, you know, we were going to have, we were going to go to this sort of third person out omniscient camera that would show the media report being recorded. Like we would see the TV cameras recording the people. And he was like, no, 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 we're just going to show the TV ads. We're just going to show the, the media break itself as if you were the viewer. Yeah. Um, and then, and then when they did the remake, they did exactly that with like the, the stuff with Samuel L. Jackson. They yeah. just went and did this, th knocked me out of the movie immediately. Cause I was literally, cause I'd known that story about Paul Verhoeven and he, how he had very deliberately made that choice. And watching the remake, like, oh, you just did exactly what you weren't supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, the remake does so many things you're not supposed to do. I was I, I, okay. I don't. I gotta revisit the remake. I haven't seen it since I watched it. I mean, uh, so I think I might have a Prime Directive sort of style revisiting where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna put my yeah. I, aside. I don't think I've seen it since I saw it in the theater. I think yeah. I, I think I saw it the one time in the theater. Um, but I have to say, man, when the when the ads like they also shot that in Toronto, like. Mm. Um, uh, which is where we shot Prime Directives. Um, uh, but it was like, you know, the second the ads started coming out, and there, there was there was lots of footage of Joel Kinnaman riding around Toronto, sort of behind-the-scenes stuff and fan-shot mm -hmm. stuff, people in the streets. And I'm like, oh, a black-armored Robocop with two guns. What a great idea. Where did you get that from? <laughs> but, he, dude, he doesn't look nearly as good as Robo Cable, though. But, but... Uh, yeah, I, I, that, that, that design's a classic, man. You can't mess with it. I, I went to opening night of the RoboCop remake because I was just like I got yeah. I, I have to know I have to know <laughs> I, right right I, I'm their center center theater with like four of my best friends on my sides just to support and I was I was like I was like uh, the fact that you see his face the whole time was like the, that was the, weird that oh, was weird it was so weird I kept I was like literally like saying pointing at the screen like. Oh, why can I see his face? I was so upset at that movie that I I chewed my tongue until I could taste blood. Oh man, I was I, uh, so pissed. I don't want to bag on it too hard because again, I don't want to like. Okay, was, yeah, that was you're, you're in you're in the that, but, you're in the but, industry, but, sure. But it's also not it's not even just that. It's just like I think it's hard. I try to just in general in my life these days. I try to sort of focus on the positive things and 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 what. And, and sort of accept the things that don't work is just mm -hmm. it, the reality is and like, again i say this from experience robocop's hard to get right yes it's especially not when easy. it's not a, it's not a slam dunk it was mandated by a studio that's the that's the problem with a lot of movies now is that it's yeah. not that someone has a great idea it's that the studio owns the property and they're like, we need a new one of these. And who can we get to write we, it for us? It's, who gets to direct it's, it? Because it's product, Because right? it's product, and it's, exactly. And, it's, and, I, and, and I know that director had a lot of things that he wanted to do that, that he was forbidden from doing. Yeah. Um, uh, but, I mean, I think if you look at it sort of objectively, it 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 does a lot of it, – it's hard as in the right place. It is still focusing on the human being. It's, it's, it's just not – the execution does not quite land because – that's hard to do. It was hard for us to even like the scene with with Murphy and and James was hard to do because ultimately you've got this guy with a with a armored suit and a and a bald head and having to play this super emotional tearful reunion, and you're like, this could go so wrong. And so I, like I that wouldn't hold on by the skin of its teeth. I'm so grateful when people respond to it, yourself included, where it's just like, oh, thank God. <laughs> because this scene could have just been ridiculous. Um, and there's, I remember, I remember scenes in the remake just feeling very awkward, not terrible, not bad, just awkward because of the choices that have been made where it's, you know, he's in the full armor with his face exposed, talking to his kid. And I'm like, okay, so yeah, you're, you're, the whole tragedy of Robocop is that, you know, there's that brilliant, beautiful line in the first movie where he's talking to uh, to Ann Lewis, where he says, "I can feel them, but I can't remember them," and that's the heart of RoboCop. Like that's the tragedy of RoboCop that there is a part of him that's gone. He just can't access that anymore. Yeah, it's the, it's um, just not even the same story anymore. It's just like a completely yeah. different story about a person who's turned into a robot police officer, and they call it RoboCop. Yeah, and, it, and that's how it, I want to it, revisit it, 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 and maybe yeah, like try to see it just on its own terms and not being offended as a fan. And just see what yeah. I can find. I'm, I want to do. There are, it. Listen, there are good things in that movie. The scene where where 
he asks Gary Oldman to show him what is left of him as a human, and yeah. it's like just this bag of organs and a head. Mm -hmm. It's really upsetting. Yeah, like it's really really effective. Yeah, um, I, I honestly, I I think that movie's main problem is it does not have a super effective bad guy. The villains, yeah. the villains are very vague. They're very diffuse. Completely forgettable villains, and the action, um, like the only good, like. There's that one action, like he goes, has one scene where he's shooting people and it's in the dark because it's a PG-13 movie and yeah. you can't even see anything. Yeah, and he's or, or else he's fighting robot drones in training simulations and all of these other things. And it's kind of like, it's, it's, you know, it's spectacle, but I want more than that. Dude, they, in the first RoboCop movie, the guy was dead and in the suit in the first 20 minutes. And then yep. in the remake, they take like the, the Marvel superhero formula where they're like, okay, yeah. well, now we got to go through the training. Now you got to learn your powers. And they, yeah, it's, because it's, there's nothing else to do. It's a very strange, it's a very strange approach. Um, uh, and ultimately, again, like I said, not successful, but I can't fault them. It's like, what do you do? You either do what somebody else has already done and then why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. Or you try to find another way into the material, but that's a risk, right? Like, it's it's always a, a you know, how do you, what's the, uh, the, the problem is ultimately for myself, for everybody who's had to make a RoboCop sequel or remake, the perfect RoboCop movie has already been made. Yep. Right? That first film is flawless. So all you can do is play variations. And if you can find new ways in, like I said, we had the benefit of going, all right, let's set it in the future so that we have some space to play with just to give us some room to build new things or or find him at a different point in his life so we have a different story to tell that's still relevant and isn't just repeating the beats of the first movie um what did i want to tell you there was something i wanted to sort of fill you in on and it's just completely escaping anyway i'll get back that's to what, it that's why whenever i do these interviews like i always try to like if i come up with an idea i always try to jot it down because I know I'm going to forget yeah. in 20 minutes. One was, thing, uh, one, oh, do you remember it? No, you, you go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll come okay. back. I'll well, I was. Uh, I do have some other things I want to touch on with Prime Directives. I don't want to... Please, by all means. Um, by all means. But, uh, going back to the scene where he's in the market in the cloak, have you yeah. seen uh, the Sarah Connor Chronicles Terminator TV show? I uh, Yeah, I love that show. I love that show. And uh, there's that scene. It's in, what is it, episode... Two? Oh, two or, or three, three with Cromarty, where with he's, Cromarty. he's disguising himself as a yeah. Yes, he he put he kills a homeless guy, right? And then he takes his and he pices his coat, yeah. and you got a you have a full like what? endoskeleton what? walking around downtown. I you, love it. You want to talk about you want to talk about shows ahead of their time? Like that was the show oh, that was God. airing on the Fox the Fox Network. That show would have absolutely killed in the streaming era. Hmm. It would be so popular. What? And they just show. struggled to to make that. It's uh, it's a, uh, it's a that's a terrific show and a really interesting take on material that had been really really retreaded a lot and has subsequently been retreaded to to less and less success. Again, because like there's 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 already a perfect Terminator movie and then there was a sequel that was an even bigger better perfect Terminator movie. You know how do you how do you do better than that? And their choice was actually really smart, which was to not focus on the Terminator. Exactly. Focus on how fucked up these people are after living their entire lives on the run. But, but again, but again, get back to the humanity of that. Like, yeah. what is this? What, there's, two, there's two, there's two elements. And this is, this also ties back to prime directives. It's like one focus on the humanity Two, what can you do that is specific to the story you're telling that no other story can do. And that's what, Sarah Connor Chronicles did. And I think to some extent that's what we did with Prime Directives. Not as effectively, I think, but I think that's certainly what we were trying to do. We wanted to tell a story you could only tell with Robocop. And not just a random action movie with a robot in sure. it. Sure. There's that episode of Sarah Connor Chronicles where the Terminator there's a Terminator sent back on an assassination mission of like a senator, but he goes back accidentally like eighty years before, right? Remember oh, that's that? right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, and one. he causes a fire by accident, which causes a building not to be built, which is where the senator was supposed to speak at this time. And so he becomes a, a right. construction worker and then starts a business right. where then builds the building and then hides himself on the wall. I'm like, just, just madness. Just so good. And, and, and <laughs> you could only do that with the with the mechanics and the vocabulary of that universe. Yeah, it was wonderful. Well, right? I, I need to rewatch that, that show. 
Yeah, it's uh, I've rewatched it a few years ago, and it's it really holds up. It's Great. it's honestly better now than it was then. I think oh, I think nice. it's 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 pretty genius. It's a pretty genius piece of program. I, I like um, I like that one scene where like because the whole time you're like Jesus, this Terminator is so hot. She's so hot. She's so hot. Like but like but and they, and they never they never even acknowledge it. But then there's that one scene where she sits down next to John on the bed, and they're talking, mm-hmm. and you're just like oh. Oh, and, it, and you're like, God, how, how is this like 16 year old boy supposed to deal with this? <laughs> like, right, right. <laughs> and they There's never actually lot. talk about it, but like, you see, you can no, sense but it's tension. just sort of there. Yeah, yeah. it's so good. It's, um... There's a lot going on, and and yeah, not to get too far off on that tangent, but yeah, the the way that series ended, it ended on such a strange, provocative note that you just feel like season three would have just been completely you know next level I, i'm so it's like the cancellation that broke my heart in my in my life yeah and, yeah. and, and like it's, and that, it, it's and that's okay again, you know a lot of, a lot of ambition a lot of ambition on display um uh, i okay with back to prime directors well i yeah. I'm, i i gotta know i think everyone wants to know where is where is lewis what happened to her well that was an interesting part of the discussion. Was I, and a re, again the reason that we set it in, you know, we projected it forward in the future because we were like, all right, are we going to do what you know would now call a legacy sequel? It was like nobody had really done that kind of thing where you just made the first film and you just ignored everything else. Um, uh, we wanted to be a little vague about it. We because we knew we couldn't bring Lewis back. Um. So we were like, okay, are we going to acknowledge two and three? Are we going to not acknowledge two and three? What do we do? And my problem is, like, I like those movies, and I didn't see any, I didn't see any compelling reason to erase them from the canon. But at the same time, I didn't want to be overly beholden to them. So there's a like, there's a reference to Cadillac Heights. There's little things like that. So we sort of accepted that, like, Lewis died in RoboCop three. So I think she's just dead. I think we okay. have to just accept that. It's not, it's not great because it's not a great death scene, but. It's certainly not the exit that character deserved. So but, you're saying that RoboCop two and three are canon in Prime Directives, then? We yeah we yeah from my perspective they are. Okay, um, I'm okay. sure we I'm but, sure we created a whole bunch of continuity errors as a result. Of yeah, that. Listen, because there was no a, one there, knows who Murray Murphy is, and everyone knows no, who that's he was true. in RoboCop no, that two. Is, that is that is true. That is true. Um, uh, so we we'll have to call it a uh, slightly alternate universe. Okay, right? yeah, that's fine. We'll let it go. We, we, well, you, this is like, this is what I mean. It's like you run into challenges. It's like, okay, we're going to follow canon until canon becomes um, inconvenient and, or it's going to get in the way of the story we want to tell, right? Okay. Um, you, can, you can sit there and tick all the boxes and make sure everyone goes, yes, we saw that movie and we acknowledge that this really happened, but that really screws up our story because we want this idea that, like, Murphy is alone. Yeah. And if, if it was. It's also it doesn't make any sense because it was publicly if people were publicly aware that. Hey, sorry, you cut out. Are you still there? Machine. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm can, still here. Can you repeat yeah. that. Sorry. Yeah. Of course. So if if it was common knowledge that that the police that this cop had been killed and then repurposed as as uh, as a as a piece of product, first of all, the cops wouldn't stand for that. Right, the police unions would be up in arms. They wouldn't want it to happen. It would be an outrage. Yeah, because there the... would be so much political pushback. There would just be all of these existential questions, and and because that could happen so to I any can't, of them. I couldn't. Exactly, everyone. Or it could happen to anybody. Not even just cops, right? Like if this is a thing. There's a great meme that's circulating right now that I love. This RoboCop meme. There's just a picture of Murphy as RoboCop where it says, um, "I know, I know which one you're talking uh, he, about." He, he, <laughs> it was like it just said, you know, brother died, and they still made him come to work. Yeah, yeah. Man dies, has to come to work anyway. <laughs> forced forced like, to come back to work. Like, like <laughs> so on point. Yeah. So on point. Um, so yeah, from that like listen, there was a there was a scene at one point in the in the original, original draft of the fourth episode. Um, that you know, we, it was never gonna happen, but I put it in anyway, just because I would thought it'd be funny. So there's this moment where he and Cable have this big fight, and they crash through the floor, and they basically like they they have to get all the way to the top floor of of OCP, and then they end up crashing and falling all the way back down to the bottom. Um, and this is an earlier version of the script; things changed, but 
uh, one of the original ideas we had set up was there was this RoboCop sort of memorabilia museum in the lower floor in the lobby of OCP. <laughs> and he, that's that's where he crashes down into. And he and the you know the clock is ticking and Saint's going to go in line and he doesn't have time to get back up there. Um, and he actually comes across the jetpack from RoboCop Three. Oh, and he was going to fly up an elevator shaft. It what, was ridiculous. What? A but it, working but I, but I wanted to, a I, working jetpack in the gift shop. Yeah, you know exactly, <laughs> exactly what I was. What I was gonna hear. What I was gonna hear. That's exact. It wasn't a gift shop. It was a. It was a museum. Okay. Okay. So it was. It was the original actual. Job. I don't know why it's fueled. I don't know. It was just. But it was like sometimes you're writing at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And like, this would be cool. <laughs> That's great. By the way. By the way, I have to. I have to. Uh, I have to disagree with you that the uh, uh, Murphy shooting the bullets out of the air is not cool because uh, I think it's the coolest thing ever. Uh, you know, I got a little. I literally. I literally. I lit. Yeah, it's okay, and it's okay. Listen, you're entitled to your opinion. Um, I think I even, but I think I like, I remember distinctly writing that scene at like five o'clock in the morning and, <laughs> and I think I literally wrote in all caps. This is the coolest fucking thing <laughs> RoboCop has ever done. Okay. I, so it's in the script. I'm sorry. It's, it's, that's just a fact. I can't change it. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Listen, you like what you like and it's okay. Sure. Um, so, uh, so here's a bit of trivia for you. Um, uh, we were shooting in the, a lot of the same locations at the same time as uh, the original X-Men. Interesting. Okay. So if you look, if you look, you'll actually see some of the same locations. So the, the, um, the exterior of uh, Metro South in old Detroit is the same train station where um, Ian McKellen lifts, levitates all the police cars in the first X-Men. Um, Wow. Okay. And there are a few other things like there are a few other things like that throughout the movie. Sort of, we kept running into their production, which was very humbling because hmm. they had a lot more money than we did. Well, yeah, I assume so. <laughs> it's uh, uh, that was always an interesting time. We would always like we would like run across X Men stunt team like setting up wire gags and things. It was pretty great. <laughs> And then we ended up mixing in the stage next to them. So occasionally, when we were mixing, I would like sneak out and go take a look at what X Men was doing. Oh man, I'm I'm jealous. That would have been awesome. It was fun. It was fun. Yeah, I had a really good time. I had a, I I have to say like. I I don't want anybody to think that like I had a bad time on it because I honestly it's still one of the 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 I my memories of of this production are still like some of the most overwhelmingly positive. It's certainly one of the best experiences I've ever had in terms of a. Uh, of opportunities and production and and just like friends I've made that I'm yeah. still friends with to this day and and you know I got to put RoboCop's helmet on one day like it was awesome. That's... I got to hang out in the in the with with the suits and and oh. uh, you know watch cars get blown up and you know <laughs> jump, ramp jump into the lake. It's it, it's it was a fun time. It was a really fun time. This is see I didn't expect this cuz I mean when I think like I said earlier when I think writer I was like I assumed that like you you wrote it and you handed it off and you you just had to see how someone produced it. Which your is baby. which which is far more commonly the case. Yeah. So yeah, again, I I when I look back at it now um, I realized just how really fortunate I was. Yeah, and now it's to like have this that huge moment and... of your life, and you have all these memories. Like this, the, oh it yeah, turned out to be such a much bigger thing in your life for I, you. That, that's amazing. I, right here. Oh yeah, I I have I have more than memories. I have Alex Murphy's gravestone in my apartment. Oh my man, <laughs> can you, I made off with it at the end of production. Can you um, can you share a picture of that? I would love to. I, you should, oh yeah, you should for sure, that. absolutely. I'll try to get some. I have uh, some people to follow you on Twitter, and you can start upload. I have a sure little. Uh, I have. It. I have little bits of props and things kicking around. I have a, uh, I have the photo of uh, Cable and Murphy uh, uh, when they were cops, like with, you know when they had their arms around each other. Just the sort of flashback photo. I still have that. Um, lots of little bits of memorabilia, and it's just nice to have because it is nice to have these little tokens that sort of remind you of this really fun time. And it was fun. It was hard work, mm -hmm. but like we were making RoboCop. Like we're getting up every morning and making RoboCop. It was awesome. Is there if I uh, if I share your Twitter handle on uh, in the in the pinned comment, uh, if I can get some people to follow you, would you share some some of your memorabilia? Oh, absolutely! No, no, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Okay, great. Everyone, make sure you go f uh, follow Joseph on, on Twitter, <laughs> and he'll he'll share some some cool stuff. I really I really want to see it. 
But yeah, that's yeah, amazing that it was a great time to to remember. I I wanted to ask when was uh, when was the look, last? I... Go, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was just gonna say when was the last time you got to just like sit down and just talk about all this stuff. Uh, it's been a really long time. Probably not this decade. That's for sure. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, occasionally, I'll have a, I'll, a someone will ask me a question, or or I will get a a, a comment. Someone will have seen it somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it it. It you know I mean it's on it shows up on Tubi sometimes I know it's on YouTube now I'm not sure how legal legal it is on YouTube but it's on there it's there nobody's yeah. stopping it so well um, well I uh, I, I had to fight the copyright a... I got copyright struck by by rights holders when I uploaded my videos and I had I, I had to I, I had to dispute were... it I got it uh, I got it cleared uh, pretty quickly though I cuz Oh that's they, good. They understood. Oh that's good. That's they, good. They understood what I was doing so it was cool. It's well it's clearly it's clearly critique. Yeah. You're not stealing anything, right? Like so I think yeah that that would be ridiculous to get struck for that. That's the whole point of doing things like that it, on YouTube is it, to is to examine and 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 critique and unpack yeah I don't that's know one if, of the great things about that platform i don't know if you've seen my other robocop videos but they're i and they're mostly stills because i i i don't want to fight the copyright holders for these hollywood films um, for sure and and and, yeah. and, it's, and you're mostly fighting an algorithm it's just doing yeah. image recognition right it's not even like somebody saw, saw it and said oh yeah shit, no it's him. instant it's before it even goes public yeah. you get notified that this is copyright yeah and uh and but but with this one in particular with prime directives i i didn't make it in stills uh like i did right. for the other ones i did it all in video because i was like people have to see this because they haven't seen right. it and and so yeah i was just so glad that i actually got the copyright uh lifted from it every time the 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 big uh my big uh my big pet peeve with prime directives uh, not with the show itself, but just how it was received is um, anytime I would tell people, they asked me, oh, what have you done? And I said, oh, I did this Robocop Prime Directives miniseries. They go, oh, the TV show? I'm like, no. Right. Not everybody's heard of the TV show. Very few people are aware of the miniseries. Yeah. Um, it just, for whatever reason, it did not have that kind of it's it's like teflon nobody remembered it or no, nobody it, saw it, it on it sci-fi we... channel in 2001 and then it didn't repeat yeah. and then it didn't get spread over yeah. to other u.s networks or anything so yeah so and, and and i think yeah i think that fireworks eventually lost the right so there was just there was kind of nobody in its corner to sort of promote it or put it out like we did so much work at the time just like literally i'm talking about myself my writing partner brad julian grant the producer director ourselves were going online to like robocop forums and stuff and just talking about the movie because we had no publicity budget and Fireworks was not putting any money into publicizing it and and it was so hard to just get people to care um not fans but 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 people in positions of power to care enough to publish well sorry you cut out right there can you repeat what you were saying size it because we were like we of course, we were we were we were doing something that we believed in. We genuinely wanted to make something special, um, and so we were trying. We did a lot of fan outreach. A lot of that kind of blew back on our faces because one of the things I've discovered about a lot of RoboCop fans at the time, anyway. And again, I'm not casting. This is not disparagement on anybody. Um, a lot of RoboCop fans love the first movie and hate everything that's not the first movie, and okay. cannot wait to tell you about it. <laughs> um, and that's maybe softened over time, but certainly at the time there was a lot of uh, really open hostility. Like we got a lot of like hostility from fans just for the like doing it at all. And I'm like, okay. Hmm. Um, uh, now, counter to that, we also met a lot of great fans. And as I say, the reason we're talking right now is because of one of those guys, uh, David Bissetta. Hi, David, if you're listening to this. Um, he saw it and pointed it out to me because he because we had that connection. And because he was just one of those people who saw it and it mattered to him and he had reached out. And so I was like, yeah, I've still like he would. I remember when he he I think he followed me on Twitter a few years ago and he said, hi, Joe, this is David. I don't know if you remember me. And I'm like, of course, I remember you. You're like one of the 10 people who loved RoboCop Prime Directives. How am I going to ever forget you? <laughs> uh, so we're, you know, for the blowback we got, um, 
you know, some of it was warranted, some of it wasn't. But I'm again, I'm 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 a big boy. I, I have a pretty thick skin about this kind of thing, and people sure. are entitled to like what they like and dislike what they like. And uh, what I really appreciated about your videos was that you you were it wasn't that you were even handed. It was that you were you looked at everything in context, mm -hmm. and you said this is super goofy, and you said what you felt, but at the same time you weren't like the people who made this are horrible. Yeah, yeah, that's no. it was it was about the material. It's ultimately about the material, right? Mm -hmm. And I and as I said, I I there were a number of points that you made. I'm like, I absolutely agree with you. There's uh I mean, it, it, I hope that when you go through the comments and I mean, sure there's plenty of people who are like, this show is total garbage. But, oh but, yeah, but the, and and but, I but there's others. That there's happens a... so often. I'm so used to that that it's like it's like fine, whatever. But yeah, but I I hope that that's okay. seeing that 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 you're also seeing all those people who are like, oh, I I really like this part of the show, or I remember really liking this, or oh, it, that means that yeah. honestly means the world. It really does. It 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 not not from an ego standpoint, not from my sake. It means the world to me that that the show. It's like having a kid, right? It's like it, it went out into the world and it actually matters to mm -hmm. somebody, and for, even in some tiny way. Right, it did some good. It did something totally. that that res that resonated with somebody as a story. Yeah, um, and, and, and the way I wanted to present it is that, like, I, I'm probably not going to convince a whole lot of people to go out and find Prime Directives or even watch the whole thing on YouTube. But if I can <laughs> show it in this way, to, to to be honest about the problems, all right, to to include yeah. my critiques, but to emphasize the things that I think are overlooked or underappreciated and the things that are really, really good, then maybe th there's a whole lot of new people whose experience of this show is not the show. It's my videos on it. And no, it, completely. It, yeah. And it gets them to be like, oh, OK, I see. I see what they were going for here. This is cool. I, I I'm, I'm happy that that you're able to see that as well. Oh, yeah, I, I I'm really pleased that people like what they like about it right and again it's it's it is what it is it was you know it's a it's a mini series shot in canada in 2000 for about 12 million bucks which is you know comparable to what the first movie cost all on its own and it's six hours um, and it's six hours yeah so we had to you know we had to spread that dollar a lot more thinly yeah um uh but it was it was made with it was made by people who are genuine fans of the original and who really wanted to do justice to Alex Murphy. I mean, that was our goal the whole time. Um, um, we had other things that we wanted to explore, but ultimately that was the goal. And I'm, I'm pleased that the ending lands the way it lands because that to me was the most important part. It was like, it was all about getting to that moment where, where James asks his dad what he's going to do. And he recites his prime directors, but they have different they have a different meaning now. It hits different, as the kids say, mm. um, because he's not—he's not reciting a, a, a list of programs. He's making decisions. He's making choices. Yeah. And and, the, and there's the post-credit scene, which I I didn't include because I forgot it existed. Uh, oh, there's a whole bunch of wrap up that I, happens there. Too. I, I got reminded of that in my comments, and I was like, "What?" And then I went and I watched it, and I was like, "Oh, that's that's a lot of good stuff." But at the same time, I'm also glad my video ends on the character moment. Like, oh yeah, no, no, you 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 picked a great spot. It's really it, it, really the important thing about that that coda is um, this. We see that Sarah Cable gets exactly what she wanted at the worst possible time, and mm -hmm. she gets she gets the comeuppance she deserves. Yeah. Yeah, I, that, what, yeah, that stuff would have been nice to include. But then again, you know, you think of the first movie where originally there was supposed to be a, another scene. Of, there was supposed to be a, I don't know if you know this, there was supposed to be another media break scene before the end credits that visited Ann Lewis in the hospital. Yes, they which they actually shot. Yeah, and they cut it because the, the yeah. emotional high of the Murphy moment. Oh, it's just because like, the movie's yeah, over at that it's point. Over. Like, like boom, the, the whole thing. It's it's you hit you hit that, you know. It's and it's and you know we we do it again in a slightly different way, but it is ultimately like the the end of Robocop. Is like he is this guy again. He is a man. I mean, he's still trapped inside the shell, but at least he knows who he is. Yeah, and he's right? got that's friends. The, that's his he's got friends now. Of, he's got a family, right? Which yeah. is which is great and and. and 
And so we wanted to build that, that idea. Um, it was like, what do you do? Like, how do you, we, I'm not saying that we did because we didn't, it was like, how do you top the ending of the original Robocop? You sure. can't, but, but you, how do, how do we appropriately end our story? And it has to be, he's free. Mm -hmm. At least he's free. Right. Um, uh, and this is like this, you know, this gift that he's been given that seems like at first it seems like we've killed him. And then it's like, no, he's actually, he's had his programming overwritten by the one guy who could actually do it, who was even a capable of doing it and be willing to do it, which was John Cable. So, and that's how he, you know, he has to redeem himself twice there because he saves Murphy and destroys Saint. Yeah. I really you know, like, and yes, I know for the, <laughs> For the for the critics, I know that's not how EMPs work, but it's how EMPs work in movies, and it's how it works in this movie. Okay, that's fine. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's science fiction. We have a little we have a little breathing room there. Just give us a little cut us a little bit of slack there. Uh, have you played the, Ro the new RoboCop game at all? I haven't had a chance to yet. I'm really oh, looking okay. forward to it. the The playthroughs look amazing. There, there's some good character stuff i think that's maybe what made me want to go back to prime directives oh that's exciting i've only i've only seen like the fps stuff i'm glad to there's, hear that there's more than it's just not that. entirely developed but there are moments uh or there's like uh like he he kind of like has flashbacks because when he gets damaged he's his like he starts um. combining past memories with what's happening now and he'll see someone who's not actually okay. there and he'll like he'll hallucinate and hear this is one moment i love where he hallucinates the sound of his son's voice uh, uh imagining what it would be like coming home as robocop and his son being frightened of him oh god yeah yeah that like there's little that's things good. like that's that good. that are like ooh that's good okay. that could have been that could have been robocop too all right, yeah, that's, uh, that's should have been. Yeah, there's there's little moments. It's not entirely developed, but it it, it has its moments for sure. Okay, Some good okay, ideas. and they got Peter Weller back, which we couldn't do. Yeah. Oh yeah, I imagine you wouldn't be able to get Weller back for that, especially no, in it was it was no, 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 no. He was uh, his feature career was was uh, he was far too expensive, and I think not particularly interested in getting back in the suit. No. Um, uh, I know. I know early meetings. Like I know Richard Eden was considered, um, but we ultimately wanted to go in a different direction. We wanted a slightly older actor. Oh, okay. Um, um, Morris was uh, was my idea. That was another, like that was another weird thing that writers just don't get to do. It was like, oh, I have a bunch of casting suggestions, and then they <laughs> cast those actors. That's I was awesome. like, what? <laughs> okay, all right. like all right, that's fantastic. So yeah, it's like. So yeah, Morris because I had seen Morris in Cube, yeah, uh, Vincenzo Natale's movie Cube, and he's fantastic in that. And I had wanted to work with him for a number of years after that, and 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 so the opportunity came along that it was like, well, who do we want for Cable? The only I think the only other actor we had thought of who would have been really good, he wasn't, although he was probably too old for it at this point, was Michael Ironside. It was the mm -hmm. only other person I think we even remotely thought about for Cable, um, but he was not going to be able to do it. Um, but Morris was like, I was like, Morris Dean went, Morris Dean went, we should get Morris Dean went, he's amazing. Uh, and I think he did a phenomenal job. And as I said, I'm really glad because we've been friends to this day. That's good, yeah. I, I made sure to point out yeah. the video that when he's in action mode, he's he's his own yeah. thing, which is what I really love about oh, yeah. Rebel Cable. He doesn't, he's and, not just oh, doing oh, a so this, okay. presentation. Yeah, this is, um, this is the thing I wanted to tell you earlier. Okay. Um, um uh, you talk about Murphy being a little different than we see him in uh, the, uh, the first RoboCop movie in the flashbacks. I mean, yeah, uh, and that was very much on, that was very much on purpose. Uh, this is this is strictly just to fill you in. All right. Um, so we deliberately gave Cable uh, certain characteristics, like "Come with me if you want to live," or not "Come with." Sorry, that's Terminator. Um, uh, live, uh, dead or alive, you're coming with me. Yeah. We gave him that line very much on purpose, and we gave him the dual wielding thing very much on purpose, um, uh, because we wanted to say, to sort of retroactively go, okay, the Murphy that you see who is just transferred to Metro West, it's Metro West in the first film, right? Yes. I'm not getting that wrong. Yeah, okay. Let's God let's like lose all of my Robocop credibility here. Um, when Murphy first transfers to Metro West. Um, 
he's he's fresh off of this break with cable um but he's sort of you know he's in a new environment it's tougher it's it's more dangerous because you know metro south was pretty cushy apparently um comparatively speaking serial killers notwithstanding hmm. um that he he's intentionally adopting some of cable's mojo yeah like the line and you know you see him briefly with the two guns firing out of the side of the the vehicle in that first that first fucking awesome car chase um and there's just this idea like how can we sort of tie into the first movie without doing this sort of like you know sometimes prequels was like well let's just check a box and like this is how indiana jones got his fear of snakes and the scar on his chin and all that stuff and it's just like you just feel like they're ticking boxes okay and we were like well what if it's a character beat what if it's like he's who's the toughest guy he knows john cable so he's in this more dangerous environment so what what's he going to try to emulate and that's so the idea is that you go back and watch first robocop again the idea is i mean it i don't think it necessarily works now but but it was in our heads certainly when we were writing it and you know we had the sky was the limit and we could just imagine peter weller um the idea was that murphy after he's transferred is is he's he's emulating cable to some small degree whether consciously or unconsciously he's still thinking about him i think that's an interesting idea at least right mm -hmm. that that he's almost mm -hmm. kind of like putting on a, a show a little bit more than he than he would like just to to be like hey i'm the new guy but i'm no rookie like i'm a tough guy yeah we, we yeah we didn't want to we didn't want to just tag we didn't just want to use catchphrases for the sake of using catchphrases we wanted them to mean something i don't know if it lands or not but that was the idea i i get where you're coming from i like i i definitely picked up on that as i i guess it i guess i felt like it maybe went a little too far in one direction it could have making you yeah, seem like like real hesitant um yeah fair but uh but but the more it goes into the story once it starts getting into like him actually like in the locker room like uh yeah kind of confronting cable that's when it starts to come together a lot more so i think well, i think as yeah, it we, went we, on we, it got better we wanted to give younger murphy an arc too right beyond robocop it wasn't just the, the story of alex murphy's life isn't he was a cop and then he got turned into robocop and that's all that there was it was like he started out he was in this place and events conspired around him to sort of make him a little a little harder edged and a little a little sadder but it's like initially he was like he was he wasn't a rookie but he was the lighter more talkative of the two mm -hmm. you know and even if you wanted like we took that and we took some of that from peter weller if you watch those early scenes in robocop he's really chatty mm -hmm. he just will not shut up right he's just constantly talking and so we we kind of added we made that part of the character we were like let's 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 look at who was who was that guy yesterday, right? Who was that guy last week? Because we never get a sense of him beyond those you know brief flashbacks of his family life. But those are relatively, I don't want to say generic, but they're they're certainly very archetypal. And we're like, well, what is specifically Alex Murphy's life? What was that guy like? And we have those very small number of clues that Peter Weller gives us in the first film, and so we just kind of retroactively expanded on them. If you could, uh, if you could do it all over again, would you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, would you have a whole um, bunch of ideas that you things that you would try to do? God, better, or... yeah. I mean, every time they announce they're going to do a new RoboCop movie, I mean, I think they're they're threatening one now, aren't they? They're threatening a new. They version. have been for years. They've been talking about like Weller's going to come back, and it's going to be like based on the yes. RoboCop sequel done by Ed uh, I... Newmeyer and Michael Miner. The corporate wars. They've been talking about that for years. Right, I, don't think, it's ever, right. I don't think it's ever gonna happen. No, it seems unlikely. Um, certainly not in the in the environment the, the the entertainment industry as it is in its current form is not you almost would have to make it as an independent film to get away with to make it properly Robocop again. Yeah, again to sort of be able to use that language again. I don't want a hundred and seventy um, million dollar uh Robocop movie with Peter Weller back and all the action is like a CG Robocop flying around and yeah, I don't want it. it I really don't. <laughs> you have to start you always have to start with the humanity. So I would to to the to the question, um uh every time I hear them threatening a new one. There is definitely, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a part of me that's like, oh man, I wish they'd call me. Yeah. I wish they would I, too. I would, love, <laughs> I, I would, I would love to get, I'd love to get another kick at that. Just because I, 
not because I feel like I need to like to have a do over. It's more from a place that like I loved RoboCop when I got hired to write RoboCop. I was a huge fan already. It's one of the reasons I got the job because it wasn't just because I was a fanboy. It's because I I had thought a lot about the character and I and I and I spent a lot of time thinking about the character and and talking about it. And as you do when you really, as you well know, is like when you really love something. Um, and you had some insights that you want to express, and then I was lucky in the sense that I got to actually express them through the real character. Um, so to get, I would love a chance to write RoboCop again, just because I love RoboCop, yeah, and I love Alex Murphy, and I love that. I honestly think, and I don't mean this as any hyperbole, I think he's one of the most interesting movie characters in the of, of the last century. Like he's really unique. Like what other character is like that in yeah. in modern films, right? Like he is really, really unique. He's not a superhero. He has aspects of that, but there's this underlying tragedy. There's this underlying quest for humanity that's very relatable, mm -hmm. and I think is even more relatable now. Is where it's like, you know, the world we imagined that was just kind of nascent in in nineteen ninety nine two thousand in Prime Directives is the world we live in now. We are inundated with technology. You know, you and I right now are talking on uh, Discord, which is which is like which has been a fantasy in nineteen ninety. Crazy invention, right? Like yeah. you're you're in. We're literally talking in two different continents right now. Yeah, it's, it's wild. And 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 it's just you know this is just what we do now. But you, you can't go anywhere. It's like eighty percent of the people walking in the streets are just staring at their phones. They're not interacting with each other. And I don't want to sound like a get off my lawn guy, but this is the fact, right? Yeah. We are we are bombarded with media. We are bombarded with with corporate control media that that and I'm not gonna go on a rant or anything, but but it's just this this is just the reality of the world we live in. We live in Robocop's world now. You know, eighty seven was just projecting forward a little bit um, as a as a way of satirizing America as it existed in 1987, um, but it is also very prescient in many 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 ways because they just really the the things they were choosing to make fun of and point out were just these very nascent ideas that have kind of flourished for good or ill. Now this is the world we live in. You know, and the the remake, uh, you know, they they take that into the, that time period where the news is like this hyper politically charged, you know, talk, yeah. you know, you know, personality driven uh, uh, news media, and then, but now, like, if a RoboCop story were told today, like, let's say, like, I I, I believe that I have my own ideas for this. I might even do a, might even do a video on it. I have my own, own mm -hmm. ideas for a RoboCop sequel. Uh, but it would be mm -hmm. the it would be the RoboCop, and it would be in its its very prime directives. It's very like the world has moved on. What what mm -hmm. what is what is a forty year old RoboCop doing other than you know, putting you know giving out parking tickets, right? Like what are yeah, they? Yeah, he's an, he's a, he's a, like like what yeah. are they keeping him around what, for? What do they right? need what this guy the... for when everyone can like like because uh... here that's that's the thing about RoboCop is like. It is a very initially impressive piece of technology in the first movie, yeah. and, and but yeah. but once you go past the first movie, you start thinking, why is everyone just standing there shooting him? Why don't they just run? Right, or, like it it, right. it it falls apart pretty quickly. And and in the world of RoboCop, they would very quickly adapt to this new law enforcement officer. Absolutely, he would no, be no, absolutely fucked. He's fucked in RoboCop two with a magnet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, completely. Yeah, so they they, yeah. they touch on it a little bit in the first movie where they bring in the Cobra assault can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're like, oh, okay, now we've got something that can actually do some damage to the guy. But yeah. but yeah, it's there's all this interesting territory to still explore. I think of this like yeah. once you once you create RoboCop, there's going to be a knock on effect. There's going to be dominoes start to fall, where you anti, know, and, and anti -Robocop it won't just be how do, Yeah. Yeah. How do we build? Well, which we tried to do a little bit. Um, with system support, which was like the whole, yeah. which was like, again, not, not a, I, it was supposed to be kind of a, it was not a joke that kind of super landed there. The idea is that when they talk about system support, it's like, they're talking about the IT department mm -hmm. and, and it's like, oh, the IT department is this like SWAT team. Yeah. That specifically like, this is how we deal with RoboCop. Just, this is like the just in case contingency. And then all their high tech stuff. Um, again, to answer your question about why they didn't keep the high tech stuff. And I'm not, again, I'm not sure. This came across the the idea is they go in high tech, 
and they end up getting completely trounced more or less by cable because he's more sophisticated and their mm-hmm. you know their stuff is designed to you know destroy this like 12 or 15 year old robot cyborg and but cable is not just he's not murphy again he's murphy better yeah right the the armor's better the the technology is better um because uh uh myself and my counterpart were busy working on it for the whole time um that's me in the background by the way in uh in the scenes with cable in the lab where oh. Sarah's uh, getting targeted. I'm the guy with glasses in the background who goes <laughs> running rapidly out of frame when she targets Sarah. <laughs> I'll have to check that out. That was my that was my little writer cameo. It was uh, that was a very fun day. What was uh, system support uh, being SS? Was that intentional? No, um, because like uh, OCP wanted, has the wanted, Nazi yeah. imagery in Robocop too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We, we we were not unfortunately we were not that thoughtful about oh, it. Okay. And actually, I think you're the first person who's ever brought that up to me. And I'm now thinking back. I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's clever or bad. Um, uh, it works. Uh, I never uh, noticed it. Someone <laughs> brought it up in a the, comment. I was like, oh yeah, okay. The 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 idea, like as I said, systems were the idea is that it was supposed to sound innocuous. Yeah. Like, oh, just call systems, just call system, system support. support and they'll fix your they'll fix your mouse for you, right? Like, I love that he brings oh, yeah, it system, up. System support. He brings it up. He's like system support, and she's just like no. And then, and then they don't even mention it, so you don't even know what it well, is. Well, because they're super illegal. Because <laughs> yeah. they're like, we're not supposed to have these guys. Like, yeah. we're a corporation. We're not supposed to have these guys. It's like, do not mention this. It goes into the record if we talk about it in an open <laughs> meeting. Like, don't mention it. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. Um, so they that, so the idea was that they you know they go in with these like uh, these like plasma cannons and and like high tech gear. And um, there's a very quick line. I don't know if it lands really well, but but uh, Eugene Clark. Uh, who plays the uh, the head of the Robo Hunters, as which is we also call them? I love it. Um, uh, says enough of this high tech crap. Give me Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson, which is why in the next one they're they're good. They go really analog when they're like attacking cable with you know it's like shotguns and that really big, uh, the, uh, actually amazing um, uh, the concrete cutter, the big buzzsaw, mm. uh, which was Ju- which was Julian's idea. Full credit to Julian for that one. He was like, how much more ridiculous and violent can we get? I remember going to set that day. Um, uh, and just seeing that was one of those days where a lot of money got spent, and I think it ended up on screen where we had just all of these stuntmen, and we had like big rain towers going, and and Morris in the armor and the rain, and I just thought it looked really good. That's one of the best. And it had, I, I thought it had a, it had a big, it had a big kind of epic feel. Certainly as epic as we could get. Uh, but that was one of those like we were always spending money like julian would want to spend money on scenes like that but unfortunately that also meant there wasn't enough money for things like um uh like i envisioned the the saint um the saint central hub being quite a bit larger and more uh, just a little more elaborate yeah and i think it ended up looking a little basic and again no no fault on anybody it's just the way it ended up I th- um, yeah, I, it was I time think... and money, and that's a minor thing. And we were very, very, very out of money at the end of it. And most of the whole thing was shot as one big movie. Um, like we didn't shoot individual; we shot scenes from everything at different points. Um, but a lot of part four was shot last because it was all interiors on on our uh, sound stages. So a lot of the interiors of OCP were shot last. So much of that movie is us in smaller rooms with not a lot of money and running rapidly out of time. So I think some of that is we didn't quite get the epic conclusion that we wanted. And again, as I said, we were aiming for it because we knew we were going to have this big rooftop fight. So it was going to be okay if we were stuck inside OCP and it was a little claustrophobic for a while. Uh, And then the rooftop was completely uh, sabotaged by a a fucking hurricane. So, well, did you, did you not have part of the fight planned for the OCP office uh, meeting room? Yeah, oh, we wanted to, we wanted to, one of the things we wanted was we knew we wanted, we were going to have Robo and Cable fighting throughout OCP and basically just trashing the place. Okay, because that's a cool right? scene. Like full, like full rock stars. Like they were, we were going, we had all of these sets and we were going to, because we knew we were shooting this stuff last, we were going to just destroy everything. Um, And it was this idea of like, you know, OCP getting its comeuppance. As well, it's like it's like all of their all of their decisions coming back to haunt them. All of those when you think about the the all of the boardroom scenes in the first two episodes and all of the decisions that are getting made that with no bearing on consequences, 
And then in the fourth episode, all of those rooms get utterly destroyed by the same guys who's, who are the consequences, right? And who had to suffer the consequences, and they become the consequences. Um, unfortunately, by that point, we've killed off of the uh, all of the board, and what I think is still the most ridiculous thing I've ever written, and I have no idea how I got away with it, where Damien kills the entire executive board, and it's reported as like fifteen simultaneous heart attacks. <laughs> I love it, <laughs> and it's like 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 that's one of those like it's it's oh. as I think as over the top as we ever went. Yeah, as like this is preposterous. This is there's no way. But then it was also like, well, you had an no, expert on. It, yeah, the ex expert comes a, on. They're like, oh, this stuff happens. The, yeah, and that's kind of all you need, right? Like, yeah. but that's the whole the the joke was, Damien committed mass murder, and then the next day he had a news story planted that says, oh yeah, this is, just happens. It's fine. Like <laughs> yeah. that was a corporate. That's a corporate coup in RoboCop world, right? <laughs> I pointed um, out. I pointed out that. Um, that Sarah and Damien have the same goal and, and that yep. if Sarah had just not done anything, yes. it, it, he, she would have ended up in the same exact position. No, completely. Which, Absolutely. Which is, she is, is funny. Um, she is a, um, she is a horrible character played by literally one of the loveliest people I know. She <sighs> is such an absolute sweetheart. Um, I adore Maria. She, and in fact, when I, when I, um, when I got a chance to direct a feature film many years later, uh, she was the first person who signed on. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, she is one of my favorite people of all time. I wanted to ask you that. I mean, we've we've talked yeah. prime directives to death. Like, what are you What are you currently cool. involved in? Is there any? Uh, do you have any recent work that you would like listeners to to, oh, to wow. check out, or, or is there something uh, in, in the works? Uh, I always have stuff in the works. I have a bunch of things that are sort of like that I can't talk about that are like really, really nascent right now. But this is like the life of a screenwriter. I've gone, God, I've gone nearly a decade now without having anything produced. But it's like hmm. I'm still working. Um, in uh, 2014, I wrote and directed a movie called Devil's Mile, which had a very, this is the film I made with Maria, um, which had a very similar response to Prime Directives. This has kind of been my life. It's just like people either really hate it or they, the people who love it really love it. Okay. Um, and they have lots of they have lots of interesting things to say about it. But again, it was made at a very low budget, very quickly. But I got to direct it this time, so I got to experience all of the uh, all of the hard decision making that you have to make when you're making a low budget movie. I think I was much more forgiving retroactively. I was much more forgiving of a lot of the stuff that I was frankly kind of pissed about on Prime Directives, where I was like, well, why are we even things like why is Paige wearing the helmet instead of having his face exposed? Like I wrote it, yeah, and and realizing you retroactively, that's a very precious attitude, and it's not super helpful. And it's just like it's not like they didn't want to do it. It wasn't a fuck you to me. It was just we don't have time. We just don't have time. Yeah. And and when I was in a position where I was like, I had not only written, I had not only written the movie, I was directing it, but I was also one of the producers, and I was like, you have to make calls on the day to just get the movie made because it's like you can either do this or you're not going to have everything you need to make the movie it's one or the other what's the name and of obviously it? your choice is I was, it's sorry. called devil's mile devil's mile yeah, go ahead. okay that's devil's all, sorry. mile okay that's Wrong. okay which i think is on tubi i believe in the united states it's on tubi uh it's probably also been pirated on youtube somewhere i'm not sure okay. um um I think we're gonna we're planning to do some sort of a video re-release uh, shortly because the rights to it have come back to us from the original distributors. Uh, we were on Shutter for a while, which was great because a whole bunch of new fans found it, and that was okay. always a blast. Um, but it's a little weird crime horror hybrid movie okay. uh, that we made for a tiny, tiny amount of money with Maria, my my friend David Hader. David and I have had oh. a, this weird connection since David. David was the writer on the original X-Men. So when I met him many, many years later, I was like, oh, I was making a movie on the same sets you were making a movie on at the same time. So that was kind of our initial um, our initial point of uh, of connection. So and wait, David, David, and I, David Hader, like Metal Gear Solid David Hader? Metal Gear Solid David Hader. Okay. So, oh, that's right, because you're a gaming guy, right? Uh, yeah, that's, my channel is 99% games. So, so David has a really fascinating career. David's also from Toronto, like me. Um, so he is obviously very famous as the voice of Solid Snake yeah. in the Metal Gear movies, in the Metal Gear games, which is what I originally knew him from. 
Um, but he's also a screenwriter. So he wrote X-Men 1 and 2, and he wrote uh, uh, the Watchmen movie. I had no idea. Um, yeah, and he's had, but he, he started out as an actor. Um, uh, the, my favorite moment is when people always already discover that like Solid Snake is also the writer of X-Men and also the star of Giver 2 Dark Hero. Hmm. Okay. Um, which is a great little low-budget crazy ass action movie directed by steve wang and if you can find it i highly recommend it it's pretty it's pretty rad um so david i knew through other people and um again when we were putting this movie together this little low budget movie um we called him up and asked him if he wanted to play the villain and he just showed up for us and we've been friends ever since and we've now written three movies together wow all right um which are now at various stages of of development wherever they're lurking but i'm hopefully we'll have news on at least one of them very soon which i'm excited about um but yeah he's a he's a he's a terrific guy and uh a really has been a really good friend to me over the years um and is in fact one of the first people who uh uh rebroadcast my original tweet about your video oh really david hater did yep I yep okay wow i hadn't i didn't know about that yeah, Dave's uh, Dave's awesome. Dave's awesome, uh, and he's a he's a really he's very supportive and uh, uh, just a really good guy. Just a really good guy. Can't say enough good things about that guy. Um, so yeah, so that was my that was my little journey. But I but again, when I was making this movie, and not to turn this into a plug for my movie, it's Do it's it. the the experience that I had just in terms of being on set on Prime Directives and just seeing the machinations of how the sausage gets made, right? Like every piece of filmmaking, I learned so many valuable on set lessons. And I, every day when I was directing my film, I, I use those lessons. Like they came in, they saved my ass so many times, just like knowing what to do when all other plans have failed and you have to quickly improvise. You have to, and you don't have those resources to just go, Oh, we'll shoot it again tomorrow. It's like, there is no tomorrow. This, this location is not available ever again like we have to get it today or we don't get it and what do you do in that situation um those became the, you know so it was an invaluable experience are you um, gonna direct again uh, i hope so um it's not here's the thing i like directing but it's not my favorite thing not because the process is difficult but because i hate getting up at five o'clock in the morning um <laughs> it's it's a very stressful job and I'm always amazed by people who can do it well. Um, but yeah, I have a couple of projects that I like. That I like. If I'm going to direct again, it has to be something I really, really, really want to direct. And there's, I have a couple of projects that I'm doing right now that I'm like, this, this, I have to direct this one. Like, there's no way I'm not, I'm not not directing. Um, until they find somebody better than me. But like, but it's not everything. I'm, I'm very content to, to uh, hand them the script and step back and hope I get to go to set sometimes. Well, I hope they because I, I enjoy that process. I hope they call you for the next RoboCop movie, if not for yeah, directing, be, at least uh, for some script supervising. It, and call me a, up, it's man. A nice, call call it's me. A, it's a nice. It's a nice dream. Um, I'm not. I'm not that high up on the food chain, um, uh, which is fine. That's it's it's the life of a screenwriter. You need an You're ally in Hollywood who's down. like, let's get, let's, get, let's get that prime director. Well, I do. Guy. I, I I have a few. Um, it, it's interesting, right? Because you want to. I don't know whether having written prime directives is a an, is a help or a hindrance in that. If I was going to sell myself, right? Like, well, I've written RoboCop before. It's like, oh yeah, what what? Uh, well, there's mini series. They're like, oh sh yeah, don't let him anywhere near that. Um, but hopefully, you know, it feels like, I don't know, it's been around long enough that it's now garnering brand new fans in part thanks to you. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased that you took the time to just sit down and watch it again, frankly, but then to sit down and then put together the videos that you made, because I, you know, just looking at them, I'm like, that's a lot of work. I can oh. tell the amount of work and, and energy that went into that. It was. I went five seconds by five seconds. I would pause oh and then my write. God. I'd write like a paragraph about everything that was happening. Then I watch another five seconds. Dude. Like I, it took me. It took me a to. Uh, it took me one to two days per episode to go just to watch. That's them. extraordinary. Well, I really, really <laughs> appreciated that. And as I said, the reason I the the what what ultimately made me decide 
after debating whether I was going to comment on your video or not was I would just wanted you to know how much we appreciated what you did and just that you that you took the time um that it wasn't just like a hate piece yeah I didn't right because it could that. have so you could have just so easily turned it into that I thought you did it in like a very funny way I thought you 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 and you frankly you unearthed some stuff I hadn't thought about so so that was I would love to hear I, what that is um I'm trying to think something specific now um um, I was just actually before we talked. I was just rewatching the video to kind of refresh my memory. If something comes to mind, I'll I'll text you. But, okay, yeah. But but it was but there was just like it was just nice. I think ultimately to see someone else's perspective on it, um, because I I don't have a lot of objectivity where it's concerned because it's tied up in my experiences of making it and and the experiences afterward and and as I say, most of there were obviously shitty days and shitty moments but my memory of it is overwhelmingly positive and i feel like it was like the 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 effect of it has been on my life has been overwhelmingly positive um but what i to see someone else come along and just sort of examine it in that kind of granular detail mm -hmm. to, to someone who even gives enough of a shit to do that is <laughs> impressive to me um, because it's because look, frankly, we were dismissed. Like we yeah. were dismissed by executives. We were dismissed by fans. Um, um, there's a, you know, it's a, it's a it's rarefied air. The people who love RoboCop Prime directives, or even not even love it, who 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 enjoy it. Um, because uh, again, I don't want to I don't want to come off like I think it's the greatest thing ever. Its flaws are apparent, right? Uh, they're self evident. Um, there are flaws in the writing, there are flaws in the directing, there are flaws in the production. But this is true of any film. Um, but you want... Ultimately, I, I appreciate when people respond to the things that made us want to do it in the first place. That we that we did somehow manage to get that stuff in there and that it still resonates now. Like, that mattered. Um, it felt really good. It was like, okay, we made these choices... Sometimes, in some cases, very uphill battles. Like a lot of the emotional stuff, a lot of the character stuff, the, a lot of that was on the table to get cut, and we fought for it. And I'm so glad that we did in retrospect because it clearly is the stuff that people remember about it now. Like when the, you know, when the when the the whatever spectacle we managed to get out of, you know, our our tiny little budget and our our very rapid schedule. When that stuff that stuff's kind of faded with time because technology has improved, filmmaking has improved. Um, that's all been bested, but it's nice to know that there's still something in there that resonates with people because that's why we do it in the first place, right? Like, it's to communicate a thought or an emotion or an idea. And RoboCop Prime Directors was just the medium for a lot of those things in the way that RoboCop was that. You know, that's we the things we thought were important are the things that you think are important. Well, I'm moved, and, I'm moved that it was able to, to. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just glad that it, it was. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. That it was it, it, something it, that you enjoyed. It's 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 a very RoboCop thing, right? To to experience this human connection through technology. <laughs> you know, right? You, it's very on point. It's very thematically correct. You, you said that you were glad that it wasn't just a hate piece, and you know what? It it would have been if I genuinely thought it was awful. Right. And if fine. I, yeah. Like if, if that's how I felt about it, that's the video it would have been. I'm not like, I'm not above making just some crazy hate video, uh -huh. but there's so much to it that I thought you nailed. I was like, this isn't going to be a hate piece like this is yeah. is, is the opposite. And uh, it, because I feel like I feel like the uh, the setting is right for something like this to. To, to come back into the conversation because, like I said, when I was younger, what did I love about RoboCop? It was that he shot all the bad guys and he was an awesome robot yeah. and the satire, yeah. the humor, the action, the blood, right? But well, as I'm getting older, I, I, I and, feel a lot more for And the that's person. okay too, right? Yeah, I know. It, of a, course it's, a, it's great. It's, 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 a, it's a layered property and it, there's a yeah. reason it resonates with different people. Yeah, I'm not saying that, that you are a better RoboCop fan because you like the character stuff more than the action. No, I'm no, not no. saying that at all. No. But but what I'm saying is that 
the reason I did my first video on 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 RoboCop, which I don't know if you've seen yet, um, uh, I did. I haven't seen you. I haven't seen your video on the original movie, but I really, uh, I really am looking forward to seeing uh, it. It's about an hour analysis that I did a couple of years ago, and that's great. I, the reason I did it was because I felt like any time you go on YouTube and or or look at articles and you do look for RoboCop analysis, they only talk about the satire and the action and the effects and and but no one ever like dives into the script and and the mm-hmm. and the person and the man and what happened to this guy and the tragedy and i was like that's what i want to do i want to i'm going to focus on that aspect of this movie and it really resonated with a lot of fans and i so i feel like there's there's a whole side of the fan base that is mm-hmm. all, that is a lot more concerned with the character stuff and i think that that side of the fan base is going to be a lot more receptive now to to giving prime directives another chance and seeing seeing what's so good about it so um, well, i i hope you're right i hope you're right i i, I think it's a question of as, as you say this is a, this was something that you experienced getting older and i think that's one of the things that's interesting about just robocop as a as a as a franchise i hate that word but it's 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 such a corporate yeah. word which just feels very anti-robocop as a concept the, the, as a concept thank you very much um what I think what works with RoboCop as a concept is that you can get brought in by the surface action. If you like action movies, there's something for you to like. If you yeah. like science fiction, there's something for you to like. And then as you stay with it, more layers reveal themselves and they and they hopefully hit you deeper and and at a at a more um a more emotional level, at a more human level in a, in a way that that a really good story does. And I'm talking about the first film here. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, there's a reason somebody said, Hey, do you want to write RoboCop? I went, yeah. Like it was an automatic. Yes. Because it, I wanted, it was a world to, I wanted to play with those toys. I wanted to go into that world. There was, and, and I was excited at the idea of, of, you know, cool cyborg action. There's a reason we had two RoboCops, you know, beating the shit out of each other. It was, it was, that's fun. Mm -hmm. I like that stuff. I still like that stuff. Um, But, but it's always great when there's more underneath it, right? You always have to, I'm always very um, appreciative of a, of a, of a, a genre film that delivers the genre goods and also gives you more as opposed to, a film that's like maybe a little more pretentious and it's like, well, we're going to use the tropes of the comic book movie to explore this deeper idea. But then it just sort of dismisses the the stuff that makes those movies fun. And that's the other thing. Robocop's a fun movie. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, you can just, it's just as a strictly taken as a piece of entertainment, it's top shelf, but it also delivers so much more below that, 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 that that's the thing that I think it makes it, that that's what made it a classic. Right. Anybody could have, you know, had Robo versus Ed 209 and and lots of explosions and blowing up the gas station and all that stuff. But it's all those other things are the thing that turn it into something really special. Yeah. Like how the studio, and I think, wanted, and I think, the studio wanted to cut the scene where he goes back to his house. And Paul was right. like, no, what a mistake that's the most that would have been. Most important part Literally, of the movie. Literally, that's the whole <laughs> damn movie right there. The ending, the ending doesn't work without that scene. Yeah. <laughs> Him turning around and saying, smiling and saying murphy does not work without that scene yeah um um and you pointed out that and and i thought you 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 drew a really interesting conclusion because um uh speaking of that moment where they they had followed that up with the scene where he goes to visit his grave which we did um and we knew about that scene for the record we knew about that 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 cut scene was one of the reasons we're like well that's a fucking cool scene like i heard they actually i heard they actually filmed it for a woke up too and cut it uh, apparently, yeah, it was, I think it was shot for the first one and cut and then shot for the second one and cut. And it just, and we, th- this was, thank you for reminding me of that. Cause I knew about that too. And, and I think it had stuck in my craw a little where I was like, I really want to see that scene. Uh-huh. And suddenly I was like, who's writing this me? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm going to write that scene. We're going to do it. We're going to do that scene. And I'm going to write it in a way that they can't cut it. Yeah. Um, because we, it, it, you you quite rightly pointed out the context is different. We're not just repeating yes. the scene of the first movie. This is this it's, is RoboCop at his most self destructive. Yeah. Quite literally, he shows up to destroy the gravestone. Yeah, it's and thank the God later. that the, 
the, the gravestone he he destroys is different than the one you see in the rest of the things, which is why I still have it. So they, mm. they didn't actually kill, they didn't actually destroy that one. So I have the I have the intact version. Yeah, um, yeah the scene works so it, it works because it's not a copy of the house scene. It's ten years later. It, the the context yeah. is different. The feelings he, are different. He's, he's got different things on his mind, and like I said, mm-hmm. the whole arc of meltdown is Murphy at his most. Uh, at, at, not as most inhuman. That Murphy as far from his humanity as he can get, mm. where he's literally trying to destroy himself because he does not feel human anymore. He's lost everything, and it isn't like a sad thing. It's just like he is gone. Like he's he really is just a machine who's been pretending to be a man, and so he just goes about. He stops having a name, and he just goes and destroys every oh, everything that, that reminds him of who he was. That scene right? with Anne, where where. Uh... He asks her name, and she says, Anne. He's like, what's yours? And he just he just turns, and he's like... It, it almost looks like he doesn't know his name, but no, it's it's like he just locks up, and he doesn't yeah. even want to say his name. It's yeah. That, he's, he's what just, a great scene, man. What a like, great like, scene. Like, there are, there are a number of ways we could have played that. Um, but ultimately, it was like, let's just play the silence. Let's just, like... He doesn't have an answer. Yeah. Right, he's 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 in flux at that point, and this is the whole thing. He has to so go to good. old Detroit to 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 learn to be human again. And it's like the first is when he when he first meets uh, Jordan in the uh, in the market in that same scene we were talking about. Um, it's a little kid, and and the father in him it. gets sort of reignited. I love right? it, this is, dude. This is this was <laughs> this was the like all of this was on purpose, right? And and it's some of it just does not land either. There's a variety of reasons. Some of the editorials, some of them are writing, some of them are just like. But the idea, the the idea behind all of these things, we were thinking about these things the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um. So it was like little pieces of him come back, and then there's the big moment where they um, uh, open up his uh, memories when they plug him in in the uh, uh, in their garage. We call it a chop shop. Um. Uh, where Anne and Abby Normal and uh, Lex plug him in and un- uncork his programming a little bit. And he has that crazy moment where he like screams and has the flashback to Clarence Boddicker. We were able to use that footage, by the way, uh, because uh, it's in the pilot in episode the show, of the right? TV show. Yeah. yeah. So we had, a- yeah, we had access because it was fireworks. We had access to all that footage. Yeah. Um, we were allowed to use all that. And so some of that shows up in um, the When Robocop Attack video and stuff yeah. and the uh a lot of the media the media net stuff where he's that shot you really liked where um uh he blows up the building and the there's that huge fireball around him that's from the tv show yeah so, i didn't you know, know i didn't know that not i'm ours. going i'm going yeah. <laughs> through i'm going through the series now uh for my first time uh so i right. didn't i didn't catch that stuff yeah that's um uh that's all because they spent a lot of money on that show yeah. And so there were there was just a lot of we were lucky in that regard that it, we actually got a lot of sort of free production value on the back of RoboCop the TV show, um, uh, but it let us do so we didn't have to go out and shoot stuff like that because I don't think we would have been managed at the scale that yeah. uh, that they yeah. did. Yeah, um, what they, I saw was like, Damn, that's they an had impressive shot. <laughs> yeah, I just, and I was like, eh, not ours, but you know what? We'll take the credit. We'll take the credit. That's that's fine. Um, so we had many many little bits and pieces we didn't use the whole thing but we we obviously did it but and i'm sure fireworks would have loved it if we could you just make movies out of the existing footage i'm like <laughs> no one wants that dude no one um it it was just this like little bits of um of his journey back to humanity and that's what all sorry you cut out can you repeat that last line you were saying part three is it is getting him back there. Yeah, you oh, yeah, cut, sure, sure. Yeah, sorry, sorry. That? So it's all about him getting back to his humanity. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so when he gets plugged in uh, and they uncork his his programming a little bit more, um, that is a, like another step on getting back to his humanity. It's just this big mm-hmm. idea. We did, we, I wish we'd gone into it in more detail because um, it's not super clear, I don't think, what exactly happens there. Yeah, you don't see um, much it, of a change in his character after that. But... Yeah, he, 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 but it was the idea is just that he's loosening up. He's, he's, he's getting more access to the person he used to be. 
mm-hmm. and it's coming in it's coming in different ways with jordan it's like a human thing with the with with that with that sequence it's 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 the technological thing so it has to come at him because he's robocop um we have to come at it in all the ways that robocop can have as i say this is about specificity right this is about doing things you can only do with robocop um, so we're not repeating the beat, but we're still laying stones on this path that ultimately lead him to the to the ending of uh, of the final episode. You know, speaking of how the, the the time change really affects the context of this, of how like the graveyard scene happening ten years later um, gives it a, a very different feeling. Um, yeah, I also feel the same way about Cable because. It, it's it's funny how um, the same idea can be received in a very different way depending on the context. Because if, absolutely, if RoboCop two, if Kane was just another guy in the same RoboCop armor, everyone would be like, "That is fucking lame." <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. But but now after seeing the failed attempts at replicating RoboCop with new designs. And mm-hmm. then scientists saying, let's go back to what worked the first time and yeah. tweak it. Now it actually works as a concept. It's the same fucking thing. It's just so it's, it's yeah. interesting to me. Well, we sort of imagined, like, again, I don't know how much thought. We put some thought into this, not not a ton. But but the, the again, the idea was that the the uh, the two doctors, the one that I play and the other one that's played by. Um, oh, my God, I've forgotten his name. Anyway, I'm sorry. Sorry, his name is Jack, and I can't remember his last name. Sorry, Jack. Um, uh, we first of all, we were are the in the script. We're not identified on camera, but in the script, we're Dr. Carl Hill and Dr. Herbert West from Reanimator, um, mm-hmm. which we just thought would be a funny joke. Um, it just seemed appropriate, and um, but the idea was that those guys were the actual designers of the original RoboCop, and they were a lot like Ed Hobley, where they'd sort of been. You know, once the product had lo- had been launched, they'd been forgotten about. And when they were doing RoboCop Two, it was like it was a whole new design team. We brought in all these new guys with new, fresh concepts and great ideas, and this very corporate idea. And in the meanwhile, these guys were just in the background going, "No, we had it we had nailed it. the first yeah. time. We're just, we're, we're just gonna, you know what? We're just gonna keep working on this in the background <laughs> on our in our spare time." And they just kind of had this hip pocket reboot robocop in there just ready to go like we could just do this like we could like no one wants the same thing again that's brilliant uh, but ultimately but you know sarah cable who who is all about digging into the past and you know manipulating james but also the um you know they have that first meeting of the trust is down in the you know in the uh in the archives where you know they've buried all the failures because she knows all this stuff she knows that like, these guys have just had this and she takes advantage of it when it suits her. We were supposed to have a. Um, there was supposed to be an ED two hundred nine in that scene, and we couldn't. We couldn't use oh. it. But yeah, that... it would. It, it, it would have just been in the background. But uh, unfortunately, we were not allowed to use that two hundred nine, which oh, is a bummer that because that's such a big part of RoboCop. Yeah, at least a, a silhouette of him on the. Yeah, wall just a just a just a just wanted to tag it somehow, right? Because it's just such a. Uh, he's such an iconic character. It, it is. It is. It makes total sense that I, I love that idea. I love that idea of the original designers of RoboCop were pushed aside to try to make the the next shiny big thing, and then yeah. someone brings them back because everything else failed, and they bring back the original team. Right. They're like, "Do what you did with RoboCop, but just like make it a little better." But and, and they're like, "Yeah, this is what worked because it, in the original movie, it's he's said to be a prototype." Bob Morton says yes. we can go to prototype within 90 days. Yeah. And on his yeah. helmet, it says 001. Like yeah, he's, which is he, why. And, and yeah. if you look carefully, Cable's helmet says 002. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's great. It's, that's, like, that's, man, that is what I like about what you did with this show. Because I, I don't care what faults the show may have. You get what RoboCop was doing on... A, a different level than I think a lot of other writers do that, that, that kind of detail right there, knowing that RoboCop is a prototype, the zero zero two on the helmet and uh, like and all the character stuff you did with, with Alex Murphy. I just think that you, you, you and your writing partners, 
you had you definitely had the right idea and uh, I want you to know that there are a good number of people who absolutely appreciate what you did well that that makes me smile it really makes me smile it's it's uh it's it's heartening to know um that we didn't waste our time yeah you know that I... that, that we and i not that i not that i would have ever thought of that but i guess in the sense of like because for me personally it was very rewarding mm-hmm. um um but it's really nice to know that you know, literally a quarter of a century on almost like certainly yeah. since we started it, like it's a long time, 25 years, um, that it, that there is a, uh, that there are still fans who, 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 who like the material, right? Like, I don't, like I said, I don't want, this isn't about me. This is about prime directives. Yeah. And, and, and it matters to me that, that prime directives is appreciated. And I'm really happy about that because it, it, we put a lot of we put a lot of thought into it. We put a lot of work into it, and and it's it's. I just want people to know that too, right? That it's like we did think about these things. We did have histories for these characters in our heads, and that may have not made it all to the screen for a variety of reasons. Some of it should never have been made to the screen, but but we we weren't just throwing things at the camera hoping something would stick. There was always a, a, a reason behind a th- behind the a, a choice. Mm-hmm. Right, because we wanted it all. We wanted to do, like I said this before, but this is true. We wanted to do justice to RoboCop. We wanted to do justice to Alex Murphy. We wanted to, to create a world that he could occupy, that made sense for him, um, and and then to take him on a journey and 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 give him an arc that made sense for him. That wasn't just putting all the toys back in the box at the end. And now he's just back to being RoboCop. He's as you knew him. It's like no, he has to change. He has to transform the whole. I don't know if you've ever seen this. Peter Weller, in a in a it was a reunion interview from I want to say five or six years ago, um, where they had Peter Weller was there and Nancy Allen was there and it was like a roundtable in front of an audience and he went on this I five or six minute like diatribe about the themes of RoboCop and how it was all about resurrection and transformation and he is he's a He's a university professor. Oh yeah, yeah. He's a as well. I'm I'm familiar with, he's, with he's, his career. Uh, yeah, outstandingly intelligent guy. And he, and he's so passionate, and he just does this whole thing about resurrection. It must be on YouTube. I'm sure that's where I saw it. Um, if you can find the clip, it's remarkable because he still to this day, it's in his heart. You know, he still thinks about it, and it still matters to him. And that's this is just the. If Prime Directives works, it's because Alex Murphy is a great character that Ed Neumeyer, Michael Miner came up with, and Paul Verhoeven developed, and Peter Weller personified. We're all just standing in that shadow, um, it, and it, we just all we could all we could hope to do is is to hit that same note as much as possible and to follow the thread of it to to some kind of logical conclusion and and honor it. And like like he says in uh, RoboCop too, right? We made this to honor him. Oh yeah! Oh, what is what a haunting scene! Best scene in the movie. It is best scene, absolutely best scene in that movie. Uh, and you know, I um, not just appreciating Prime Directives, but also uh, Morris and Paige Fletcher. Both of their performances yeah. are to be appreciated. I'm I'm thrilled that you were able to get it to Morris. That's amazing. And I don't. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, hopefully. Page Fletcher, it comes up on his YouTube feed I, or something. I he hope need, he I, deserves I, I, to to know. Yeah, Page Page was uh, um, and I don't know what was going on. Like I didn't spend a lot of time with Page. He was a very private guy. That the opportunities I did have to spend with him um, were very good. He was so serious about the material, but he was a he was a very haunted cat. Um, um, he was going through some stuff and I, you know, I don't know what it was, but I just know that that was, he did RoboCop and then that was it for him. Um, I hope he's just still out there somewhere. I hope he's found happiness somehow, you know, because he was so effective and he's so, he so cared. I mean, he got that tear out in that one scene, right? When he just, it's in it and he, and he really, I don't think it would have worked with any of the other actors. I think that they were considering, I, I think he was very well cast. I think... Um, it always grates me a little when, and it's, it's a fair comparison, like, or, pardon me, it's a fair critique, uh, uh, the height issue, but it's, that has so much more to do with framing. Yes. And that's what I said. You just got to frame it right. Um, it's, it's page is the size that he is. 
right? And he's not a small guy. It's it's just that um, um, James is really tall. <laughs> that too. He's a really t- that 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 guy's really tall. Um, um, I I'm sorry. It's late in the day, and his name is escaping me. I apologize. Uh, Anthony Lemke. There it is. Sorry. Anthony Lemke is very tall. So is Cable. Uh, and so is yes, half, and, the, yeah, half Morris the police is, department. <laughs> yeah, Morris is tall. And, and you know, you can lay criticism at somebody's feet, but it was ultimately like, Paige was the right choice for that part. Yeah. And, and I know he was very... Um, he was not happy with us because um, Robocop gets his ass kicked a lot. But that's a again, that was a choice, right? So it was we sort of demolish Robocop a lot and he doesn't really have big hero moments. Uh in the way that you sort of expect a movie hero to have. He gets his ass kicked mm-hmm. all the time. Um uh, and Paige was, I think, just as an actor, he was like, I don't like that as a <laughs> like he hated that he kept getting knocked down. And I had to say, look, I said the strength of Robocop, the strength of Alex Murphy is not that he gets knocked down, it's that he gets back up. Yeah. Iraqi. And, that's totally it's rocky it's it's batman begins which came out later but this, this, it's the same idea um it's this it's it's uh, we were thinking a lot about indiana jones in the first raiders of the lost ark all he does is fail <laughs> in that movie all he does is fail but he gets back up and keeps going and that's why we love that character and so that was what we really tried to imbue with alex murphy and, with, and then we tried to communicate to page because i didn't want page to feel like he was playing a loser because he's not. Alex Murphy is not a loser. No, he's he, just the world. He gets he, beat. And he's he, not his world anymore. He gets, yeah, and he gets back up. And like it's like if you look at him at the beginning of Prime Directives versus him at the end of Prime Directives, that is an arc upwards, right? Yeah, he is ascending. He ends up a far better place, right? He is lonely and defeated and obsolete and meaningless, and. At the end, he is a father again, and he is the last hope of Delta City. He is the only thing anyone can count on. So this is, you know, that's a that is a that's a hero arc. Yeah, that's a hero arc if I ever heard one. Man, like I was just, yeah. I was just blown away by by how well you you took the character of of Alex Murphy to the conclusion because there's, there's an article I read. I don't remember what the site was. It was like 20 years ago and it gave me a a term that I, that I use commonly when I talk about sequels and I call it the RoboCop two problem, which is Mm -hmm. where RoboCop one is a done story. Like that's the end of the story. And, and, and what do you do after that? Oh, well now he's got to fight this bad guy and now he's got to fight another robot. And it's like, you already told the story and a lot of, yeah. and I think a lot of movie sequels have the RoboCop two problem where like, yeah, that's also the Die Hard two problem. It's, yeah. um, I, when I, when I'm, uh, when I'm, I, I sometimes mentor screenwriters and I, I, I think a lot about screenplay structure and why movies work. And I, and I try to make it as simple as possible for writers to conceptualize their stories. And the, the, the example I always use Die Hard is a great example for it, but the the specific thing that I always say is, um, if you want to start, if you want to tell a good story, um, think of a character, and now imagine that person on the worst day of their life. (laughs) Okay? So that's Die Hard, right? Yeah. But but the problem is, Die Hard 2 is only the second worst day of that guy's life. (laughs) Right? So it's not, it's fundamentally not as interesting. It also, it's also... A, a retread in ways. It's Christmas again. Oh yeah, it's yeah, yeah, another yeah. hostage situation. And, and I and I and I and I understand that motivation because you know I talked about the specific vocabulary of RoboCop, the thing that makes it identifiably RoboCop. It's not just the suit, right? Yeah. It's all of these other pieces of the environment. It's it's tonal. It's the satire. It's the violence. It's it's the character. It's the humanity. It's the pathos, and all of that combines to create what we think of as robocop right like you say robocop everybody gets the same image in their head mm-hmm. right worldwide and this went from a from a script that nobody would make because it had a stupid title and it's a stupid title but now it means something different because of the movie that was made right it, it and to to continue that bit about the about 
the RoboCop 2 problem is that's what yeah, I'm yeah, liking about Prime Directives is I feel like it solved that problem where well because we found we, we found an, we found the next worst day yeah that, you know what that's a, a, exactly exactly you didn't right. take RoboCop into the into the next story you took the man that we saw at the end of RoboCop and took him into the yeah. next story which that's is what no one, yes, exactly right. no one else did no one else did that and yeah, because they saw meant, the action figure. Exactly, they saw the action figure, and and now you end up with like, and I like what you're saying about the worst day of someone's life. It's like, yeah, it's mm -hmm. pretty hard to get a worse day than what's happening to Alex Murphy, right? But like, well, yeah, but, and that that movie's a series of 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 of, of, horrible, of bad horrible and worse days, days right? Yeah. He gets he gets his his face blown off, and then yeah. it's like, and then it gets worse from there. Yeah, and, and so how do you create? another worse situation where, where it's like yeah well now this guy's been in a basement for 10 years and he has no friends yeah it's it's it's, it's you know he's smiling at the end of robocop yeah. because he solved one of his problems which is <laughs> who am i yeah right but yeah. he is still he still has this fundamental change right that is not for the better where he's a, he's a face and some bodily and some bodily organs mm -hmm. in a encased in a metal shell that's his life now now he's smiling because he's you know he's beat the bad guy and he's he's achieved this kind of catharsis, and that's how you you want to end the movie on that note. That's the appropriate place to end the movie, and 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 it was the it. There's a reason that ending gets cheers because it's perfect. Um, it satisfies every question, like it answers every question that we've had. It satisfies every single um, problem. Mm -hmm that he had he's 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 reached this cathartic point and you just want to get out and it gets out instantly which is great there's no epilogue and as you, you know we talked about the 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 one that they filmed they're like nope this is where you leave leave now and people are happy if you leave two minutes from now there's a there's a very quick fall off um so where was i going with this um it was about all right so so what problems does he still have and, and it can't be the problem he finds next Tuesday. It has to be further along. Okay, so he's a machine. What happens to machines? They 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 get old. They become obsolete. Yes. What happens when your machine is also a person? Like, they can't just decommission him. He's a person. Technically speaking, he has rights. So they do the next best thing they can do with him is they sort of prop him up as a, as a promotional device and they throw a weird party that birthday party for him which is yeah. really fun to shoot that stuff is really um cause, well because we just wanted to show him being kind of useless <laughs> and and struggling and then you know we immediately go from that to him in the in the uh uh he has the you know we, we started with an action scene oh I'll, i want to answer that's a question i wanted to answer for you a little a little insight for you um things that happen weird things that happen um the original opening scene of prime directive the opening action scene was written as the um, assault on OCP that starts off um, part two meltdown. Um, it was going to be Anne and her crew, which is why you see a lot of the beats are very similar. Um, like there's an attack and then the cops show up and then Sandra Smiles shows up and then he crashes through. Okay. Um, so that was written as the opening of the of the first movie. And we, we, one of the notes that we got, and it wasn't a bad note. I want to point this out. The executives of fireworks, they, it was, it was not a bad note. They did not want to pile on the, the, the cyborg, uh, the, the cybernetic stuff too quickly. Um, cause it was really didn't come in cause we saw them once at the beginning of this one episode and then we never see them again until the next one. Um, and they were a little like, ah, it's going to be hard for us to sell these as four different movies. And I'm like, dude, it's going to be hard for you to sell these as four different movies. Cause we're not writing them that way, but okay. Um, so we, but we were told you got to move that scene. So we, so we moved that to the beginning of part two, but that left us with this big hole. Like how do we introduce RoboCop? We already wrote the scene where we introduced him. Um, so we took a lot of the elements and originally John Cable was going to be introduced in front of OCP and a lot of that stuff got moved. Um, so we, we had to come up with a new crisis for him to solve. And we were, I remember distinctly, it, I was in my kitchen, Brad and I were in my kitchen, it was like very early in the morning, like 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 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and we were just sort of like hopped up on lots of coffee and just trying to come up with something. Like, we need something, something, something. And I said, I don't know, we need like a bunch of guys who just like blow themselves up for no reason, but not that, but something like that. And Brad, to his credit, <laughs> went, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, back up, back up, back up, back up. <laughs> 
what what do you mean? I'm like, I don't know, it's just like this idea of like suicide bombers, but they don't achieve anything. <laughs> like they just they don't blow other people up, they just blow up themselves as this kind of it was the idea of like they're they're performing the actions of an extremist political statement without any actual statement. It was this idea of just like empty anarchy. <laughs> And so we said, all right, they're called the bombs, and they're all named after different kinds of explosions. The leader was named, uh, the leader doesn't get named, but his name is Chuck Conflagration. <laughs> and then there's John, Johnny Nitro, which is the guy he sends out to blow himself up. And, and they have, all had names. You they, have Malcolm they had, Explosion. Malcolm Explosion, which we, I think that <laughs> might have been Brad. I wish I could take credit for the one, but I'm pretty sure that was Brad, because that's very much his, his sense of humor. And I just remember. We would get a little goofy while we were watching, while we were making these. And we didn't, as I said, we were this kind of little, between Julian and Brad and I, we were this kind of little secret cabal of like, just, you know, sitting in a corner, rubbing our hands together, going, oh my God, I can't believe they're letting us make RoboCop. And we would just go to Julian, like, we had this really ridiculous idea and he would just go, okay, let's do it. Like nobody was there, nobody was policing us. <laughs> Certainly not at that stage. They weren't paying that close attention. That's one of the advantages where you have a you have a, a a production company that whose investment in your property is not not a hundred percent. I'll put that I'll put that as diplomatically as I can. They had other things they were they had other projects in, in, in the pipe that they were much more interested in. So they weren't actually paying that much attention to us. So we were getting away with things. And I think if they, you know, look back at like, why did we let that happen? So yeah, Malcolm Explosion was one of them. We were just kind of come up with silly things. And and the bombs were just like a silly three o'clock in the morning idea um, that nobody said no to. You sort of come up with these, you go, yeah, but somebody will stop us, right? Like, we'll just do this now, but somebody will stop us. And it's like, nobody stopped us. <laughs> and, the next, and the next thing I knew, I was standing, you know, this frozen night on Cherry Street in Toronto, not far from where I live now. Um uh watching these guys run under the street and then like blowing up dummies it was it's it, listen it's i've never had so much fun in my life honestly i think like this is that was my and that was my job <laughs> right for a while that was my job i have to remind myself of that for occasion. like, like, for like my job was like going and watching right? well yeah almost like from 98 late 98 show came on in then, 2001 yeah, 2001, and there was a long post process, and we were there for that. We were around for production, so yeah, it took us. It took the better part of a. It took the better part of 2000 to make, and then it took a little while before it hit the air. I think. Hold on one second. I think I have. While I was looking through my archive here, I think I found the original shooting schedule. Hmm. Yep, I have it. Look at that. I can actually tell you when we started shooting. This is the kind of granular detail people love in the podcast. Right? Mm. Well, at, <laughs> let's at, see. At, at, at two and a half hours in, uh, the the people who are still here are are the ones interested in this. Right, right, right. Oh, forgive me, forgive me. It is not the schedule for RoboCop. It was the schedule for the thing we were going to do after, which was not. Ended up not getting made. Okay, never mind. My bad. Uh, Didn't pay close enough attention. Sorry, just cut that part. I don't want to build up people's anticipation for shooting schedule discussions. People love that. Um, but yeah, I would say it took a better part of a year. Like we were, we were in production for, I want to I felt like six months is probably more like three. I'm not that great at, at estimating time periods, certainly retroactively. Um, uh, but it was a long, it was the longest shoot I'd ever been part of. Most of the, most of the films I'd been, um, uh, involved with had been like, like 18 and 20 day schedules, like very low budget, very quickly filmed. Um, and this was. A lot of the same crew from those movies, but suddenly we had, it felt like a luxury, like we had months to shoot. Um, and, you know, many different locations and many different sets. And, 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 you know, we had huge stunts and explosions and all kinds of crazy shit. It was like every day something crazy was going on. Um, the, the first two days were filmed. We shot the, um, the exteriors with uh, Cable and Murphy uh, in the flashback. So that was like the less exciting stuff. And then we got to the graveyard and, the first time Paige came out in the suit was at the graveyard for the for those scenes, um, and it was quite the trip to just like sit there, and, like kind of buzzing, like waiting for him to come out of the makeup and trailer, and just like he came with holy fuck, RoboCop! Like we're <laughs> yeah. making a RoboCop movie. He's right there. Holy shit, it's RoboCop, and he's real. It, what what's up with the shot where the chin strap is not? Right? Oh, is that so a, that's a, is that so a pickup that, shot? That's, 
No, that's the that's because that's the first day. Wow. That was one of the. I I want to say, in fact, that may have been the first shot. I want to <laughs> say that might have been. So that crane shot. So that's kind of like everything right and wrong with RoboCop in a microcosm, with RoboCop Prime directives in a microcosm. Is hugely ambitious crane shot. It was really complicated. It took like I. It took several hours to set up and get like the crane move right, and then. The, and then the then, next then shot. Huge costume. The next shot is just like, it doesn't work. It's like, oh, for God's sakes. It's weird because it in, was that, just, in that same scene, the chin strap is fine. It's that one shot. They, because they fixed it <laughs> afterward. But, but like, it was just the side. I don't know what, again, I, I don't want to speak to other people's decision making. But, but like take two i don't know fix it and do it again like yeah. it was just i think it was just there was a lot of stress from like it had taken a long time to do that first shot and there was a there was a, a lot of excitement in like we're going to do this big epic shot and this is going to sort of set the tone for everything that we're going to do from now and it in a way it did right it was like huge ambition and then granular failure hmm. where it's just like oh and the people then like oh nobody praises that shot nobody praises the crane shot they all make fun of the chin strap yeah right and so which was its own thing. Um, so yeah, so here's a story. Um, like all true RoboCop fans, all of us, we were very, we always had a little twitch every time um, in the first film, the uh, the uh, chin guard would vanish mysteriously. Right. Right. But no one noticed the helmet, the helmet comes the off. And it's no, no, no. Of course not, because you're fo again, you're focused yeah. on the important thing, which is and the they story pan and they down the emotion. And, yeah. But but yeah, the helmet is is like a it's like a it's a two because like I've had the actual, I've had the actual thing in my hand, right? Like I know exactly how it works. It's a two part mechanism, um, but there was no, there was no way I can see how. And if you watch the first movie, they do it very cleverly, where you see the helmet come up, and and it's all about selling that makeup job. Yeah, and they pan um, down slowly, and you don't even notice yeah. that. You don't even think about the chin strap. No, no, no. It's just he's taking the helmet off, and that's what matters. And here's what he looks like, and it's actually the big reveal of his face for the first time in the movie since since we last saw him alive. Yeah. Um. So because we were in the days of nascent CGI, and we were able to do some things, I had had the suggestion. Um. That we do that we deal with that, and my idea was that we would have the chin strap would sort of um, tessellate and pull up, kind of like what Iron Man's armor ended up doing. Uh, where it would like we, we, so we were actually going to do like a cgi we weren't going to do it. this was my idea i suggested this and and so the idea was he was going to for the scene when he takes the helmet off to talk to jimmy we would see for the first time what happens to the goddamn chin strap such a silly thing to be concerned about but it was like let's see it and so it would sort of like break off in sections and sort of fold up into the helmet and then the helmet would come off and that's and then fans forever would go oh that's what happens <laughs> it's, it's a novel so, idea is it? yeah so so instead of that we get this other thing where they just decided to keep the chin guard on which is just a hundred times sillier looking right because first of all it doesn't make any sense because we've never seen that before um and again i say like it to this day blows my mind that the emotion in that scene carries because of stuff like the chin guard speak stuck to his face. Dude, dude honestly, the chin guard ha has zero effect on that scene. I'm glad. It, I'm it glad being... to hear it because it, it really, I found it very glaring at the time and I was there that day. But again, no one, I was like well past the point of where anyone was listening to me or indeed I was willing to risk <laughs> making a stink because we were, you don't, you don't, if you're on film set, if, if this is of any value to anybody who works in film or wants to work in film, if you are on set, and especially if you are not, if you don't have a specific job on set, like being the screenwriter long after production has begun, um, don't do anything that causes more time to be added to the day. Right? The worst thing you can do is cost the production time or money. It's 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 a no. It's just a no no. It's just bad set etiquette. Um, and I knew that then, and which is why I don't, I didn't say anything. Um, I would always make notes and talk to Julian later, but in that case, it was just like, okay, we're doing this, I guess. Um, but I'm really glad to hear that. Again, it didn't matter. Like no, that makes me so happy. That makes me all, so man. happy because I, I, I've always found it so distracting. No, 
And again, this is this is not this is all me. I'm this is not I'm not disparaging anybody. These, as I said, the the makeup team on that movie were friends are still friends of mine. Um, the the uh, my buddy Sean Smith, who was Rob Botin's assistant, who was in charge of all our suits on set, uh, is still a friend of mine. Um, um, they all had challenges that they had to deal with. This is not me criticizing anybody. Perfect. It's just that I found that choice very distracting, and I'm glad to hear that I'm the only one. Or yeah. apparently the only one well, that I know of. Anyway. Uh, well, speaking of makeup, let's... Okay. The 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 face makeup job to the helmet in in the back yes i, I gotta know yeah. because because i'm i just started watching the canadian series and they do yes. it like the movie does so yeah. why so, were they not able to do that for this for this series so it can for very much the same reason and this is much this is as much as i know um and again i want to i want to say this is not um, a friend of mine, David Scott, I only recently found out that my friend David Scott was actually responsible for that makeup because I wasn't around for some of that. Um, David is an excellent makeup effects artist. Um, he did a movie a few years ago called Backcountry. Um, and the effects in that are harrowingly good. Like he is an excellent effects artist. So this is not in any way meant as criticizing David. Um, and I'm not being political. This is just a fact. Um, for whatever reason, and I think it, and it comes down to scheduling, um, for whatever reason, the production was not able to get a head cast of Paige. And uh, for the people who don't know, you when you create a prosthetic of an actor, um, you have to create a, a plaster mold of their face. So you create a duplicate of their face that you build the makeup on so that it fits their face perfectly. Um, and that's how that's just how that works. So that's it. You, you your head is completely encased in plaster, and then a negative mold is made. And from that negative mold, they create duplicates of your face on which prosthetics are sculpted, and then those prosthetics fit your face perfectly. This is just this is how it's done. That's just strictly for people who don't know. Um, I've had it done. It's a slightly terrifying claustrophobic process. Um, for whatever reason, and I don't know, I don't know if it was page, I don't know if it was budget thing, I don't know if it was a time thing, um, there was no head cast made of page. So right away, the makeup team were working at a massive deficit Interesting. in terms of what they were able to create. I, I have no idea why. I don't know why. Well, that's just what um, happened. This is what happened. This is the story. I was told by people on the team that there was like, this is, you have challenges when you do not have uh, a head cast. It's, it's, it adds orders of magnitude of difficulty to create something that's effective. And also, you're competing with Rob Bottin. Yeah. Who is a genius. He is a absolute top of his craft in terms of prosthetics and also and not just in terms of technique but design the way that he approaches makeup effects if you look at that original robocop design he built it in such a way that the back of peter weller's head looks tiny like like you see when you can see all the components i'm making gestures with my hands like you can mm -hmm. see me this is ridiculous um he designed the the face makeup in such a way that it's like an optical illusion that it looks like the back of his head's been carved away that is actually like less there, which you obviously can't really do. You could do it now with with CGI. Yep. No problem. Um, but he did it there. It's it's essentially an optical illusion. Yes. And it's incredibly effective, right? And there's just this level of detail and and like he is a, he is a true artist. Um, and he just is one of those guys. Like I wish he worked more. Like he sort of has left the business, which is a shame. Um, but but so you've already got. So think about these poor guys in our makeup department. They are dealing with the highest of high bars that they have to hit, right? Now we don't have the tools they need to even try to get there. So they're already, forget it, that's off the table. So they are now doing the best they can do with the material that they have in the time that they have. And it's what it is, right? It's nobody's favorite makeup at all. Um, it's serviceable. But it's not, I don't think anybody is putting that on their reel, right? Sure. Um, uh, it, it, it resembles the original makeup, but it is not the original makeup. Um, and I understand why people criticize it. But, and this isn't me trying to make excuses for people. This is just me going, I have some insight into the struggles of getting that thing made. And this is what I can tell you. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, I mean, it's it's good to just get the story behind it. The... Yeah, and, and and but I think like I think criticisms of it are valid. Yeah, sure, sure. I I have my own, but this is for what it's worth. These are the circumstances under which it was created. You did you see uh, Guardians of the Galaxy three? I have. Yeah. Yeah, and that. That's a RoboCop face makeup job, right? Oh yeah, very much, and, and, very and, much. And yeah, the, and, I had uh, not thought about that, but you're totally right. Well, totally right. well, Star Lord actually insults him and calls him like a knockoff Does RoboCop. He? Yeah, he calls him I, like I, a yeah. Oh, he, that's brilliant. He actually calls him ro- like a RoboCop, bad RoboCop copy or something. That's he said he says it funny. in the movie, and then I noticed this when watching the movie the first time. I was uh, there are hints of the musical score that come from the robocop theme there's mo- really? the, the, the main theme musical theme of the guardian of guardians 3 goes yeah. it goes like da 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 really? yeah it's like a variation of the robocop theme yeah i, sw- I will I swear. have to listen i i i only saw it i've only seen it the one time i love those movies i've only seen that one the one time i i might have missed it. i think i was too busy crying over rocket's yeah. story yeah um check it out uh Speaking, I will watch it again. I will definitely watch it again, and I will keep that in mind. That's really interesting. And again, speaking of genre movies that aim for character, right? That that transcend Mm -hmm. spectacle and give you something more underneath, right? Yeah. That actually care about their characters and and, and try to give you something of value as a human being. Um, Without without being pretentious while still going, this is supposed to be fun, right? And that's important. That's really important. Everyone has really good character stuff in that movie, actually. Um, yeah, I you know, agree. there was something that you mentioned earlier when, when talking about uh, when talking about RoboCop and Murphy, and you were talking about the fact that like this this guy's a person; he has rights, and yeah. that, I I think that's a good question. Does he? Because he's uh, uh, officially property of OCP. I, and I, it, I yeah. I, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say it's an interesting question that could be explored as to like like could robocop get a lawyer right like like well, he's still a person does he have, it, what are his rights speaking of i mean the value this is why i think there's actually a good argument to make more robocop stories mm-hmm. whether they are remakes or reboots or sequels or whatever what have you is is again what can you can you tell a robocop story that resonates with the world i mean what's robocop but a story of of the quest for bodily autonomy mm-hmm right there's a hugely powerful metaphor there um so when you talk about this idea and of course this this i think in ocp's mind he doesn't have any rights i think they view him as as um bob morton says in the first one when he's talking to ann lewis he says you know he he he's the product yeah um that's how they view him but we don't like that's it well it's certainly legally, how, it's never right. actually been explored and and could be and it, that's it, what it, in a sarah connor chronicles sort of for universe, sure you could go it, there the, I, I think the reason they keep him, apart from he has a, um, well, there's a number of reasons. I think that some of which are are embedded in prime directives, and some of which are just uh, more abstract. But I think I think if you were to dig into the history, in my imagination anyway, it it makes more sense. Like the 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 trouble, the cost of the moral and legal and and uh, just bullshit level cost of decommissioning quote-unquote robocop essentially killing him um the pushback from that would be so potentially dangerous for them legally mm-hmm. that they just re- put him away and not worry about it and let him sort of die of old age if he can even do that but it's like just put him where we can't worry about him yeah we'll drag him out every once in a while use him as a as a um use him as a publicity device because we're you know selling delta city or whatever but there's also a line that we gave to um to teddy moore the old woman She's never referred to that in, on camera, but she's called the old woman. Um, she's great, too. Uh, uh, I love her. I think she's fantastic. Um, she is, by the way, um, the uh, the teacher in A Christmas Story. Fun fact for you there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you go back and watch A Christmas Story. So, you know the, you know the movie Christmas yes, Story. Yes, of course. Everybody, it's very timely, actually, right now, because, of course, we're in December now. Um, the uh, In the scenes where... Um, where the kid gets his tug stuck to the uh, to, to the, the pole, frozen yeah. pole. She's the, she's the teacher. That's funny. I didn't that's, know that. that's 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 <laughs> Teddy Moore. I did not realize it until years later, and I was watching a Christmas story, and I went, "Oh my God, it's Teddy!" 
Um, it, you said she had a but, line. So, was... yeah, so she has a line when they're talking about, I think it's in the first episode, um, uh, where they're talking about getting rid of Robocop. I forget the context of it. Forgive me. It's been a really long time since I've seen these. Um, the uh, She says Robocop is the only reason any of us still have a job. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and just this idea that she, she, for whatever reason, has some affinity for him. Yeah. Um, that she's, you know, obviously she's worked at OCP a long time, but, but she was, you know, she was probably there in some capacity when he was first created and she probably has some, uh, like a reverence uh, for his legacy. She has a reverence for him or like she, yeah, she, she sees him as, as important yeah. in a way that other people view him as disposable. So at least until, you know, which is why the whole, that whole ridiculous subplot with Cable, um, framing Murphy, which we got in and out of very quickly um because it's kind of a trope um we just kind of wanted to use it very quickly but it was this idea of, like her reverence for robocop is an obstacle for sarah cable and that's why mm -hmm. she has the first thing cable does is, is is essentially frame murphy and and make him a menace or apparent menace um that's why because she does have some reverence and there's going to be no getting past that until unless they can specifically yeah, they frame him and change, change her mind, right? It, Threaten her directly. There's um there's a a story point in the RoboCop Rogue City game where um what's happening at the time in Detroit is there's a mayor, mayoral election happening between the okay. mayor from RoboCop 2 and a new guy okay. and a new guy, right? <laughs> that's an that's a fascinating callback. Okay. Yeah, and then in the new cuz it this cuz it takes place right after RoboCop 2 but before 3. Oh, I see. Okay. 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 And uh, and there's a new uh, candidate for mayor that's uh, very, very uh, kind of. I, don't, I guess he was. He's very OCP, right? Right. Uh, and, right. And uh, he is trying to use RoboCop. Like both both candidates want RoboCop to kind of be like, "Hey, endorse me," because the public loves you. And so you can right. choose to endorse mayoral candidates or abstain. <laughs> Okay, which is awesome. I I chose to abstain because I'm like I don't think RoboCop would get involved in this. Uh, yeah. But, but um, the uh, the OCP uh, or the, the the more corporate mayor, uh, he promises to RoboCop. He's like, hey, if you endorse me, I'm gonna make part of my campaign uh, focused on granting you full human rights. Interesting. Yeah. So you like you have to like decide like do you go into the temptation for your own self interest to endorse a political candidate that, that well, goes I'm, against what you stand for? I'm honestly impressed that that they choose to go there and like again as I said the all the footage I've seen has been FPS footage so I'm actually happy to know there's a little bit more to it at least yeah it's that's good it's that's there good it's not fully fleshed out and I think the pacing is kind of poor it's kind of gets right. dragged out. But those little things make you see that they that they get it. They totally get it. Yeah. In a way that yeah. I think you guys did. So it was really yeah, cool. Yeah, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. I'm going to definitely have to check this out. Cool it's, concept, um, though. Of granting, like, hey, I'll grant you full human rights if you endorse my political right. candidacy. If you stand right. on stage like, with me. Like, it's something to, to be, like, as if your human rights are something to be bartered, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's wild. That's, that is, that is kind of, that's actually pretty good. That's pretty good. That's impressive. I will have to check that out. I wonder, I don't know who, who was responsible for the writing of that game. I'm, I'm curious, but uh, at least it sounds like they have the, uh, the right idea. As I said, as totally. I, you know, ad nauseum tonight, it's RoboCop is hard to get right. <laughs> yeah. Uh... It's tricky. It's much trickier than it appears on the surface. It's, tr it's hard to get right. Well, Joseph, we're coming right up on three hours now. <laughs> so... Wow. Okay. Apparently I had a feeling. We had a lot to talk about. Yeah. That's okay. I knew it was going to go this long. You know? <laughs> I, I mean, I alone well, I appreciate... can talk this for three hours, much less with the with the co-writer of, of the Prime Directive series. And I'm like, well, like I... you said, you haven't been able to even really like have a conversation like this. No, it's actually been really nice. It's been a nice trip down memory lane. It's been nice to, to sort of re re-explore some of those concepts and sort of think about stuff I was thinking about back then and, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, illuminate some of the behind the scenes stuff that maybe makes some of the stuff on camera make a little more sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, it do definitely does. Yeah. Um, this could have gone on for another hour and a half picking apart little details. Uh, I did. I've done a couple of shows. No, more than a couple. I had a, um, 
I had a series on Rumorg TV on their on their YouTube channel called Anatomy of a Scream, where I did uh, breakdowns of specific scenes from horror movies. So that is another thing that I do sometimes. Um, so I break down scenes from like The Thing and Psycho oh, and cool. Alien and things like that. Um, uh, I haven't done this. I stopped just before the pandemic started, and they keep bothering me to do more. So maybe I'll go back and do more. But you uh, yeah, I, I I appreciate the. Uh, it's another reason I appreciated what you did because I'm like, yeah, sitting down and just breaking it down and examining the pieces and putting it back together again and giving it new context. Um, so, like I said, I, I replied to your video not out of uh, not out of a sense of vanity, but just really honestly to for the same reason I'm doing this interview. Um, really, just to to show some appreciation for what you did because I thought it was really valuable, uh, just as a piece of film criticism. Well, um, I appreciate that. I don't do film criticism. Often my my own my own my own involvement aside. Oh, it is it is. Um, but I uh, I just wanted to let you know that I I appreciated it, and not just because of my own involvement. I just appreciated a good piece of film criticism and and the effort that that goes that you went to. Um, and I thought again, I thought you you had some excellent insights. You you were really fair. Um. Yeah, again, you made it funny, which I appreciated. I did love those little, uh, I love those little chuckles that you would insert into some of the scenes. I'm like, yeah. Okay, I, I kept some of my a actual live reaction. I recorded myself as I was watching it. So those oh, that's my, really cool. Those, oh, okay. That's, that's fantastic. my authentic reaction <laughs> to him shooting the, Amazing. the, head, the headshot in the, in the yeah. bank scene. And, yeah. and, and then when Damien pulls out the, the recorder, that's me losing yeah. my shit. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic! I also don't know why there's a big antenna attached to his it's recorder. So by the way, dumb. Was, again, it was like, it. it made no sense. It made no sense to me at the time. But again, it was like it was always supposed to be a pocket recorder pen. He holds it up, he beeps it, he talks into it, he puts it away. And I don't know why it would need an antenna. It looks so like it it's, looks like so 19th century. It's like it's like why does it have an antenna? What's he not transmitting? It looks, it's not a walkie-talkie. It's so funny though. I but but it. To, to to Kevin's credit, he plays it. <laughs> right he's like you give him a prop or something to where he's going to do that all right he's playing it all right that's 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 fantastic i uh i i've always really appreciated that i uh he's another actor i wish was in more stuff because he's so talented and so funny and so charismatic and just such a he's so good at playing that kind of character and he really nailed it he really really nailed it um uh, as i think you know i think many of the actors i think we had a lot of um not to go off on too far of a tangent, because yeah, it is three hours in. But um, uh, as I say, I'm so proud of so much the work that the actors did because it's sci-fi is hard, right? And RoboCop is hard, and it's and it's you have to take very ridiculous things and make them feel real, even when you're being openly satirical. That nobody winked at the camera, <laughs> nobody goofed it up, um, and they just they just went for it, you know. And I, I as a writer, that's the best thing you can possibly ask for is to have actors who come in and like take the material in the spirit in which it's offered right yeah i think the the actors to you know i i think a lot of the the characters are are strong and uh and uh they, they like you said they take it seriously and uh yeah you know it was it was funny um i told you that the second time i watched the show is when the one time where i said that i hated it and i watched it with my friends and i had to apologize yeah. like i yeah. I've, I've been as i started rewatching prime directives i told i told my friend i was like hey i'm gonna <laughs> I, remember that prime directive show he's like oh yeah i was like i'm gonna rewatch it and see what's up and I, it was like 20 or 30 minutes into it i messaged him i'm like dude this is way better than i remember what the fuck yeah <laughs> It's it's funny like you come at every time you come to something you come at it as a different person right so yes. it's, it's those different things that resonate well then as I said I, as I said uh, throughout this it's 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 nice to know those things still resonate yeah it's really nice to do and I think you know I think uh, uh, however many people listen to this interview I think they're gonna appreciate uh, you know uh, getting to uh, hear some behind the scenes stories and. Uh, I think they, I think they just uh, are going to appreciate knowing that you have heard from them that you have that you that you and, and yeah, other I, people involved have heard. I, hey, we there's stuff that, that we really like about this, which is awesome. Right, yeah, and this is, and, and, and this is what I'll say is like if you're a person who likes Prime Directives, I hope, I hope you come away with a uh, uh, new appreciation for the stuff you love. If you're a person who doesn't like Prime Directives, also cool. Yeah, just... um, but I hope at least you 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 have some 
perspective on the things that you don't like about it and why those things exist. It was certainly out of, not out of laziness and certainly not out of a lack of caring. Yeah. Um, some, sometimes, you know, when the rubber hits the road, this is like reality always wins. And whatever dreams we had in our head for what it would look like or how it would play, uh, reality always wins. And sometimes you win those battles and sometimes you don't. And, and you make do with what you have. You have we, we tried our best with the resources we had. And again, I'm not trying to make excuses for it. It's just this is, it, was, it was something made with a lot of love for the original character. It was made with a lot of uh, uh, good intentions. And I'm glad to know that uh, at least some of what we put on the page made it not just on screen, but uh, resonated out through time and still uh, is still hitting fans today. Well, now it has been immortalized on YouTube, right? And now it's forever. Now it's forever. People will be finding it for the for the rest of Google's history. Look, right? if you get one more person to watch RoboCop Prime directives, you will have achieved something. I think we got plenty. <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mayo. I really appreciated this opportunity, well, and uh, and again, you. excellent, excellent work. It was very impressive. And thank you. Uh, every every speaking on behalf of everybody at Prime Directives, it it it, it uh, in as much as I can do that, um, uh, it's appreciated, and we thank you, and uh, and uh, can't wait to see more. And if you have any questions, just you know, shoot me a line. I absolutely will. Okay, and to close it out, um, I just have to ask: uh, Do you agree? Heavy uh, eye makeup, best. Oh, uh, best God, ever. yeah, right? absolutely. Okay, hundred percent, hundred percent. There we go. Very, very good. Okay, now, because <laughs> uh, if you said no, I was just going to delete this whole thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. Anybody who says no to that is a cop, but not Robocop. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh well everyone i hope you enjoyed this uh long but very informative and entertaining <laughs> talk this is uh this has just been a, a total pleasure i i uh, the last interview i did i interviewed the three like the two directors and producer of the robocop documentary uh oh excellent i still haven't seen that i'm really looking oh forward to you it. gotta see it so the, these last yeah. two interviews have just been a total pleasure Last three, God, I just had on the director of my favorite horror game. So this has just been great. Um, so thanks a lot, Joseph. Uh, and yeah, thank um, you, Mayo. Take uh, take care. Have a good night, and I'll yeah, let you, you know too. when this goes up. Cheers, man. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.